What secret obsession is shared by kings, popes, and presidents, Templars, Freemasons, and Founding Fathers, Renaissance Masters, Modern Architects, and NASA? What has been encoded in art, architecture, and urban design, spanning the whole of recorded history up to the present time? These are the secrets in plain sight. As a teacher of architects, it was the buildings in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons, and The Lost Symbol that started me on a journey of exploration. What I found encoded in these structures was stranger than fiction, and perhaps even more compelling. Friends kept handing me interesting nonfiction, and after a while I felt that each was a clue in some overarching and interconnected mystery. I felt I was seeing no more than the tip of an iceberg. As I investigated further, I unwittingly began an initiation into the ancient mysteries. As I progressively uncovered a body of knowledge, cleverly hidden in plain sight, in the design of important buildings, famous works of art, in long-distance alignments between sacred sites, and in the streets and public spaces of many of the world's great cities. What I have uncovered is a story about monumental works specifically designed to embody a symbolic program of ancient wisdom. This wisdom relates to core truths about the design or architecture of the universe, best expressed by musical principles, sacred geometry, and number theory. What I am calling the architecture of the universe is closely related to the hermetic philosophies of Pythagoras and Plato. All is number. All is mind, indeed all is consciousness. These ideas originated before the pharaohs, and the specifics of this ancient science have been passed down through the centuries by secret groups dedicated to either preserving heretical ideas in dangerous times, or to exploiting the knowledge itself for the acquisition of temporal power. You might be surprised to learn how people living at what historians call the dawn of civilization possess the ability to accurately measure the size of the earth and to survey long distances with a precision rivaling GPS satellites. You'll discover how the oldest surviving temples elegantly encode an understanding of earth, moon, and sun that is in some ways more advanced than modern science. We'll travel virtually to Giza, Stonehenge, Jerusalem, Rome, Paris, London, Edinburgh, New York, Washington, D.C., Winnipeg, and San Francisco searching for answers. In these places, I uncover an interconnected system of geometry and symbolism, going back at least to ancient Egypt. We'll find Pythagorean triangles, Vesica Pisces, Rhombi, pyramids, octograms, enneagrams, and zodiacs encoded in much of the world's great architecture and urban design, exposing a secret obsession with ancient symbolism spanning the centuries on up to the present day. Many researchers past and present have uncovered important clues in this mystery. I've synthesized the work of many other authors and been fortunate to make my own connections via books, the internet, and the democratizing power of free tools such as Wikipedia, Google Earth, and SketchUp. What I'm about to share with you is an ongoing effort, and I invite your participation. I believe the time is ripe to reveal what has been hidden for so many centuries and bring this body of knowledge to public attention for the benefit of all. After reading The Lost Symbol, I was intrigued with Washington, D.C. It's a city overflowing with esoteric symbolism. Zooming in from space as we can in Google Earth, let me point out a few landmarks. Here's the White House, Capitol Building, Washington Monument, Jefferson Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, and the Pentagon just across the Potomac. Rick Campbell has uncovered much of the underlying geometry of the city on his informative site dcsymbols.com. He sees the following diagram in the streets and interconnection of monuments. The geometry consists of a pentagram over a cube, all contained within an overarching pyramid. Each one of these shapes carries a meaning we'll be exploring. We'll see later in Egypt how the pentagram symbolizes the microcosm, 
which is everything in the universe, human scale or smaller. The cube is a recurrent esoteric symbol for the body that we'll be running into all over the world. I found a pair of three, four, five triangles between the cube and the pyramid. Turning off the cube layer, you see the rectangle surrounding the White House is also made up of a pair of interlocking triangles, this time with 5, 12, 13 proportions. 3, 4, 5 and 5, 12, 13 are the first two Pythagorean triplets. As you'll begin to appreciate, Pythagorean knowledge figures prominently in decoding this mystery. Where have we seen an unfinished pyramid before? On the back of the dollar bill, of course. If we illuminate the DC pyramid with the same all-seeing eye of providence, we are directed to a specific building. Is this the eye of providence we are looking at, or its older incarnation as the eye of Horus? Either way, what is behind the all-seeing eye of the sun? It's the headquarters of Scottish Freemasonry, which goes by many names, including the Supreme Council, Mother Council of the World, and House of the Temple. This building is loaded with Egyptian symbolism, with a 13-step unfinished pyramid on top, just like on the dollar bill, and two giant sphinxes flank the entrance out front. The architect John Russell Pope modeled the 1911 building after the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, now a part of Turkey. As one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it served as tomb of King Mausolus, which is where we get the word mausoleum. The house of the temple correspondingly serves as tomb of Albert Pike, sovereign grand commander, confederate general, and the most famous Freemason of his times. Pike wrote Morals and Dogma, the handbook formerly given to new members up until 1974, which details the 33 ranks of Freemasonry. The House of the Temple is where the climax in the lost symbol takes place. Campbell shows how the elevation was designed ad quadratum, which is Latin for by the square. Ad quadratum is a sacred design template we'll see employed in the District of Columbia itself and at Chartres Cathedral. The sunburst above the entry is at the center of the square, and the top corner marks the symbolic apex of the unfinished pyramid. The bottom corner presumably marks the crypt where Pike is interred. Scottish Freemasons are really into the number 33. There are 33 columns in the house of the temple that are 33 feet high. This is the place where a hard-working initiate can attain the highest 33rd degree from the 33 members of the Supreme Council. 33rd degree Masons are often found in positions of power. Many presidents of the United States were Freemasons. The Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania has a permanent exhibit featuring the portrait and signature of each of these presidents with a record of their Masonic careers. It is difficult to verify Masonic membership because some members do not make their involvement a matter of public record. However, each lodge keeps its own records. I find it interesting that George Washington, Harding, Eisenhower, Carter, and the younger Bush all chose to be sworn into the office of the president with a hand on this Masonic Bible dating from 1770. One has to be male and believe in a supreme being to seek membership as a Scottish Freemason. They insist their fraternity is not a religion, although atheists are ineligible for membership. Freemasonry is not a secret society, but members are strongly admonished under pain of death not to reveal core secrets. Much of what happens inside the house of the temple has been pieced together by outside researchers in recent years, and this has been brought forward in Dan Brown's book, The Lost Symbol. Members can rise to the 32nd degree through hard work and study, but only those selected by the Supreme Council may attain the highest 33rd degree. Richard Hoagland and Mike Barra have dredged up the most interesting connections between the Scottish Freemasons and NASA. Here is Cape Canaveral at Kennedy Space Center. 
These are the two launch pads where all the Apollo and Space Shuttle missions left Earth. Here is the single runway, runway 33. Of all the vectors they could have chosen for the strip, why did NASA choose 33 degrees west of north? If that seems like circumstantial evidence to you, how about this? Here is astronaut Buzz Aldrin, 33rd degree Mason, on the moon holding the flag of the Supreme Council, which he later brought back to Earth and gave to the Supreme Commander of the House of the Temple. These examples show that the Freemasons and NASA are obsessed with this number. I'm wondering what's so special about 33? Where else does this number appear? Jesus is said to have performed 33 miracles and to have died at age 33. Perhaps this is no coincidence. The Bible says King David, father of the famous Solomon who built the first temple in Jerusalem, reigned for 33 years. In the Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism, there are ten sephiro in the Tree of Life, plus another hidden one called Doth. Adding the twenty-two paths between sephiro brings the total up to the magic thirty-three. My theory involves the Schumann resonance. This is the frequency at which the Earth vibrates. Scientists have measured the standing wave at 7.83 hertz, with a wavelength equal to the circumference of the Earth. This inaudible low hum is due to lightning discharges in our conductive ionosphere, causing the planet to actually ring like a bell. If you do the simple calculation, which I've done here in a spreadsheet, you'll see that middle C is 33 harmonics, or 32 overtones above the Schumann resonance. Sound implausible? Think of it this way. Our bodies resonate 33 octaves above the Earth's fundamental vibration. This fits with the ancient hermetic motto, as above, so below. I find it incredible that the UN emblem divides the Earth into 33 sectors. This has to be more than coincidental. The human spinal column appropriately has 33 vertebrae if you count the fused bones in the lower spine individually. 33 might very well be built into the architecture of the universe. For further confirmation, let's take a look at the Great Seal of the United States of America as shown on the back of a $1 bill. Let's start with the obverse side of the Great Seal. That's the side with the eagle. Most important to our current line of inquiry, let's count the number of feathers on the wings. The left wing has 33 feathers, and the right wing has 32. Could these refer to the 33 harmonics or 32 overtones just discussed in relation to the Schumann resonance? I think Rick Campbell has correctly decoded the controlling geometry. Three circles with their centers on each other's circumferences form a kind of double vesica Pisces, if you will. A vesica Pisces is formed whenever two equally sized circles come together such that their centers are on each other's circumferences. A star of David emerges from the three circles' intersection points. Examining the reverse of the Great Seal, we find the same controlling geometry. Look at the letters picked out of the mottos Anuit Coptis and Novus Ordo Seclorum. Never mind right now what these mottos signify. The letters at the points of the Star of David are A, S, N, O, and M. Rearranging, we get Mason. So to summarize, we've seen how the House of the Temple presides over a street pyramid in Washington, D.C. There is a clear Masonic connection to the Office of the President, NASA, and the United Nations. The Scottish Freemasons are obsessed with the number 33, which is echoed in the Judeo-Christian tradition, having a resonance both with the human body and the earth. It's no secret that Masons trace their history back through the Knights Templar. I was amazed to discover there is an urban village straight across the Potomac from the White House called Rosslyn. Many researchers believe one of the Templar factions fled to Scotland after the infamous raid that destroyed their order. Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland 
was the place featured in the Da Vinci Code, where Sophie learned she was a direct descendant of Jesus, and where she was reunited with her bloodline. Friday the 13th, October 1307, was the date most of the Templars got arrested, had their considerable assets seized, were interrogated and tortured to death by agents of the French king, acting in cooperation with the Pope. Knowing the connections between the Templars, Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland, and the Scottish Freemasons made me take a closer look at Rosslyn, Virginia. Rosslyn has two important features, a dense urban village and the Marine Corps War Memorial. So I drew a line from the center of the Marine Corps Memorial in Rosslyn, Virginia, to the center of Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland. You've got to love Google Earth. The Great Circle Path passes precisely over the apex of the Eye of Providence and the entire DC Street Pyramid, arguably confirming my line of reasoning. Before we leave Scotland entirely, let's take a detour to Edinburgh. The Royal Mile is Edinburgh's oldest and busiest tourist street. If we measure a line from the façade of Holyrood Abbey, built in 1128 by King David I of Scotland, to the circular tower in Edinburgh Castle, built by the same king, we find that it measures almost precisely eight-sevenths of a mile. The Royal Mile referred to in Edinburgh is therefore the Egyptian Royal Mile by definition. This is a memorable and important unit because as Richard Heath shows in his book Sacred Number and the Origins of Civilization, there are exactly 3,456 Egyptian Royal Miles in the polar radius of the Earth. King David built these structures right at the beginning of the Knights Templar's existence, shortly after the Knights returned from Jerusalem and the Gothic building explosion began. Could King David I of Scotland have been connected to the knowledge the Templars unearthed from the House of David in Jerusalem? Let's return to Washington, D.C. and see how the Royal Mile is encoded there in plain sight. Zooming into the area in front of the Capitol building, many researchers have identified Masonic compasses built into the street plan. The compasses that run along Pennsylvania and Maryland avenues point to the White House and the Jefferson Memorial. The spread of the compasses is one royal mile. I might chalk this up to coincidence if it wasn't for the diagram Richard Heath has published in Sacred Number. Heath's diagram is drawn as a grid of equilateral triangles, so every edge measures one royal mile. The Jefferson Memorial, White House, and House of the Temple are centrally located on these nodes. The point of the Pentagon facing the White House is at this node. This is simply too much coincidence to have not been the product of intentional design. I find the ancient Flower of Life diagram fits perfectly into this grid. The Flower of Life has been found all over the world. Wikipedia lists the Flower of Life in 15 countries so far. Here's the Flower of Life at the Osirion Temple in Abydos, Egypt, which is a minimum of 3,300 years old. It's a little-known fact that Leonardo da Vinci even studied the Flower of Life. This is the second depiction of a cube we've seen in D.C. Metrology, the science of measurement, is one of the keys to deciphering secret architecture. Each side of the larger cube spans two triangles, forming an edge length equal to two royal miles. The polar radius of the Earth is 1728 times two royal miles. This equals the 3456 royal miles referenced by the Edinburgh Royal Mile. The number 1728 links DC with the mythical New Jerusalem described in the Bible. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. The dimensions of New Jerusalem describe a cube 
whose volume is 1728 billion furlongs. Did you ever wonder why the U.S. and Israel have such a strong bond? D.C. is the New Jerusalem. Here's the 1992 Israeli Supreme Court building in Jerusalem. Does this pyramid on top containing a window look familiar? It appears to be the Eye of Providence, the same symbol found in the streets of D.C. and on the dollar bill. Many researchers have seen the Tree of Life from Jewish mysticism encoded in D.C.'s traffic circles and monuments. However, DCSymbols.com is the only place that shows how the streets and traffic circles match this early depiction of the Porte Lucis Tree of Life from 1516. The Portal of Light version is shaped like an actual tree. Maybe that's where the Tree of Life got its name. Scott Circle's gently curving streets mimic the shape of the Pythagorean Y. In the secret architecture of our nation's capital, author David Ovison says, The Pythagorean Y is a vestigial drawing of a path through life in which one is perpetually presented with a choice of symbolic directions. Should one do good or bad? Scott Circle is in the position in the Tree of Life known as Doth, the hidden Sephiro. According to the Kabbalah, the reason Doth is depicted as hidden is because humans who remain selfish cannot see it. Only those who orient themselves in the service of others are able to see the light of Doth in which all ten Sephiro are united as one. I think Scott Circle exemplifies the secret architecture of DC. It's plain to see once you have the knowledge, but remains hidden to the general public. Most people who know the Tree of Life are more familiar with the Athanasius Kircher version of 1652, which is arranged in three columns. The Kircher version is seen here in John Evelyn's plan to rebuild London after the Great Fire of 1666. Both he and Christopher Wren submitted plans based on the Tree of Life, although Wren's wasn't as in-your-face as Evelyn's. Neither were actually carried out but it shows you this kind of esoteric symbolism wasn't anything new when DC was laid out a century after the Great Fire of London. As you've seen, there is a deep connection to Judaism, both in the Tree of Life and in the metrology of Richard Heath's larger cube that links Washington, D.C. with the mythical New Jerusalem in the Bible. To understand why both the Flower of Life and Tree of Life are in D.C., you need a one-minute visual education in sacred geometry. The Flower of Life grows on the Tree of Life. Flower of Life geometry is based on the 2D reality that six circles fit perfectly around a central seventh, shown here with quarters. Flowers eventually bear fruit and with a growth of circles we have the traditional fruit of life diagram containing 13 circles. Connecting the dots reveals Metatron's cube, an important diagram in the study of sacred geometry. It was named after the biblical figure Enoch, who was transformed into the archangel Metatron. Metatron's cube contains the five platonic solids, both in smaller and larger scales, like a fractal. Platonic solids figure prominently in Plato's philosophy, after whom they were named. The dots and in the interstices encode the pattern of two intersecting Pythagorean tetractuses. This is the pattern on the dollar bill, in what is called glory above the eagle's head. Pythagoreans swore an oath to the tetractus, which was the most important symbol in their secret worship of number. All of this symbolism is interconnected in a system. Masons study for years to understand these things and advance through their degrees. Freemasonry is a remnant of an ancient mystery school. Look at how many lucky thirteens are on the obverse of the Great Seal. We've already seen the thirteen stars of glory over the eagle's head. In the eagle's claws there are thirteen arrows, Thirteen leaves on the branches hold thirteen olives, and there are thirteen stripes on the shield. Perhaps having thirteen colonies was no accident. 
Curiously, the eagle only has nine tail feathers. Everything has a meaning in symbolism. The thirteenth degree of Scottish Freemasonry is called the Royal Arch of Solomon. It's about Enoch, descent into a vault, the arch, a triangle of gold, a cube of agate, and the name of God. Enoch supposedly excavated nine chambers, think of the tail feathers, underneath the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, one below the other, each with a supporting arch. In the final chamber he placed a cube of agate inset with a triangle of gold engraved with the holy name of God. By this sacred geometry, Rick Campbell has shown Enoch's cube is in fact Metatron's cube, the triangle within the cube. The name of God shown in Hebrew is called the Tetragrammaton, the most sacred four-letter word in Judaism. The letters of the Tetragrammaton are traditionally shown in the Pythagorean Tetractus because it encodes the Shemham Horash, or names of God, which in Jewish mystical tradition corresponds to 72 arrangements of the four holy letters. The practice of assigning numbers to letters is called gematria. Here we see how the letters in Enoch's triangle encode the number 72, the number of names of God. When you get deep enough into most religions, you eventually encounter a belief in the sacredness of number. Enoch was supposedly transformed into the Archangel Metatron when he was 365 years old, his age being an obvious solar reference. Speaking of solar men being elevated to the divine, let's look at the Capitol Building Rotunda. This center point of American democracy figured prominently in Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol. Investigative mythologist William Henry has interpreted the significance of the Capitol building as the solemn temple at the heart of America. Looking up through the oculus in the Capitol dome, we see Constantino Brumidi's huge fresco entitled Apotheosis of George Washington. The word apotheosis means elevation of a man into God. George Washington is sitting on a rainbow up in the clouds surrounded by thirteen maidens and flanked by the goddesses liberty and victory. Henry has dug up what was probably Brumidi's inspiration for depicting Washington riding on a rainbow in front of a stargate. Here is Jesus doing the same. Both are man become God. The fresco at the heart of America clearly elevates Washington into some kind of solar deity. Six allegorical groupings in a hexagonal arrangement tell stories centered on the ancient gods Mercury, Vulcan, Ceres, Minerva, Neptune, and Columbia. What does all this pagan symbolism have to do with the official history of the United States? Nothing. There are 72 stars surrounding the fresco, recalling the names of God in Jewish mystical tradition. An astronomical take on this number of stars is the fact that it takes 72 years for the Earth to process one degree. We'll be learning more about the processional cycle in Rome. Looking deeper, there are several crypto-references to the Egyptian goddess Isis, particularly in the allegory of agriculture. Flora with exposed breast and young America in liberty cap stand in front of Ceres, goddess of agriculture. A sheaf of wheat is often used to depict the goddess of nature, shown here as Virgo. An exposed breast and the liberty cap are well-known attributes of Isis used extensively during the French Revolution. Here the symbols are shown together in Delacroix's Liberty Guiding the People. The goddesses personified on both sides of the Atlantic as nature, reason, liberty, freedom, and Columbia are all esoteric references to the Egyptian goddess Isis. Here's a silver dollar showing liberty with a liberty cap on a pole. This particular coin happens to be worth well over six figures today. The seal of the U.S. Senate shows the now familiar red cap as well. To top it off, the goddess Freedom on the outside of the Capitol Dome 
and recently in the middle of the Capitol Visitor Center, are yet more depictions of you-know-who. The architects of the Capitol are clearly obsessed with the secret worship of Isis. Following the goddess Liberty upward, we see how the entire District of Columbia was originally surveyed by George Washington in 1791. The mile markers are placed ad quadratum, just like the elevation of the House of the Temple built more than a century later. This later organic interruption in the lower portion of the square became Alexandria, Virginia. In the ancient world, Isis had an important temple on the island of Pharos, just outside Alexandria, Egypt. Pharos was the location of the Lighthouse of Alexandria, wonder of the ancient world. The light that shone from it was the Stella Maris, Star of the Sea, one of the many epithets for Isis. The highest point in Alexandria, Virginia, has a replica of the ancient lighthouse in the form of the George Washington Masonic National Memorial. George Washington and many of the Founding Fathers were, of course, well-known Freemasons. Pay special attention to the three cubes forming the body of the lighthouse. We'll see this symbolism again in London, and finally decode it in Paris. How is it that we keep finding secret connections to Isis in ancient Egypt, in a country that has no ostensible reason to make this symbolic linkage? Believe it or not, Pennsylvania Avenue is astronomically oriented to the heliacal rising of Sirius. The ancient Egyptians based their calendar on this phenomenon, which is the day when Isis's star, Sirius, is visible on the horizon just before sunrise. From the White House in early August, Sirius is visible a few minutes before sunrise, directly behind the Capitol building. From the perspective of the Capitol building, sunset on this same day passes straight down Pennsylvania Avenue and sets over the apex of the pyramid atop the National Post Office. If you overlay a pair of pentagrams over the Capitol building, a couple of interesting things occur. These edges follow Pennsylvania and Maryland Avenues, and RFK Stadium from 1961 is framed perfectly in the crook of the opposing pentagram. I noticed four radiating streets above and below the Capitol building. Then it clicked with the pentagrams, and I see what is actually depicted here is the Templar Cross. Can there now be any doubt who is behind the program of symbolism in D.C.? The Templars may be long gone, but the Scottish Freemasons remain active today. We'll learn more about the Templars at Chartres Cathedral, and again in London. David Ovison's groundbreaking book, The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, reveals that D.C. has more zodiacs than any city in the world, concentrated in what is called the Federal Triangle. The Federal Triangle contains many important governmental structures, including the National Archives, the National Post Office, the Departments of Justice and Commerce, and so on. Most importantly, Ovison shows how these Federal Triangle Zodiacs draw attention to one constellation in particular, Virgo. Virgo the Virgin is an esoteric representation of Isis. Ovison's research into Masonic symbolism led him to map the stars Arcturus, Regulus, and Spica to a terrestrial triangle connecting the White House, Capitol Building, and the point where many think the Washington Monument was supposed to be. You see the Washington Monument is shifted slightly to the east with respect to the White House Jefferson Memorial north-south axis. Some claim this shift was due to the fact that the marked point is on landfill and the site where the monument was actually built is on solid ground. In any case, here is that particular stellar arrangement brought down to Earth. We see Virgo over the Federal Triangle and Leo over the Capitol Building. 18th century Masonic French astronomer Jérôme Lalande wrote, The Virgin is consecrated to Isis, just as Leo is consecrated to her husband Osiris. So Isis is linked with the Federal Triangle and Osiris with the Capitol Building. 
The Virgin's right hand points to the White House, but her left hand is actually on the Washington Monument. This is very interesting to those who know the Isis story. Could Isis be holding Osiris's golden phallus in the form of the Washington Monument? As the ancient Egyptian story goes, it all started when Set became jealous of his brother Osiris, who was king of all Egypt, and whose girlfriend was the beautiful Isis. Set then deceived and killed Osiris, cut his body into fourteen parts, sealed all but one of them in a coffin, and sent it down the Nile. As a final insult, he tossed Osiris's penis into the river. His sister consort Isis was at length able to recover and magically reconnect all of Osiris's parts, except for his penis, which was unfortunately eaten by a fish. Isis fashioned a golden phallus, attached it to Osiris, and brought him back to life with a song. From this experience, the resurrected Osiris became Lord of the Dead. Isis was impregnated with the golden phallus, and their son Horus grew to become God of the Sun. It's the original story of sex and violence, jealousy, incest, and pregnancy. The Washington Monument is an obvious phallic symbol. The Vesica Pisces paths surrounding the obelisk suggest female genitals. Taken together, the symbols represent the joining of Osiris and Isis and the conception of the sun god Horus. Now maybe you think I'm going too far at this point, but take a look at what is above the elevator that goes up the shaft of the Washington Monument, the same ride Robert Langdon took at the end of the lost symbol. Right above the elevator doors, there is a bronze sculpture of George Washington, sculpted by French Freemason Houdon, and above that is the winged disk of Horus. What in the world does this Egyptian solar symbol have to do with America? It's a clue to the secret meaning of the obelisk in the most public of places, but how many actually see it and understand? The dimensions of the monument are all sixes and fives. What an amazing coincidence that 6,660 inches equals 555 feet. We'll decipher the meaning of sixes and fives in Egypt. The Washington Monument is not a true obelisk cut from a single piece of stone. Instead, it is both literally and figuratively a monumental work of masonry. Bernard I. Peach's meticulous metrological study of the Washington Monument reveals a sacred diagram projected on the earth. Based on the exact height and angle of the pyramidion, its face and ridge lines project down to the ground and trace circles that are proportioned ad quadratum with respect to each other. The diagram shown here is called the octogram star in mathematics. It's a symbol used in many religions and cultures around the world. I'll briefly trace the octogram star through history to uncover its meaning. The earliest example I've found that has this symmetry is the star of Inanna, the Sumerian goddess whom I think all the Isis obsession is ultimately based on. Archaeologists identify the Sumerian culture as the oldest civilization on earth. Sumeria predated ancient Egypt, but it wasn't even discovered until 1890, so that must be why most esoteric references are to Isis rather than Inanna. I highly recommend reading the collective works of Zechariah Sitchin for an alternative, albeit controversial theory, on the origins of civilization. But that's another documentary entirely. I have found the octogram star in many other places around the world. The Hindu star of Lakshmi is a pure octogram star. The Egyptian Ogdoad adds a central cosmic egg to the mix, containing the sun god Ra. The structure of the Celtic calendar resonates with the octogram star. The Gnostic theologian Valentius transformed Egyptian concepts into Christian ones in his 2nd century cosmology featuring the Pleroma, or Godhead, in the center. The Buddhist Wheel of Dharma has this as its symbol, incorporating the Eightfold Path. Islam uses the Rub el Hizb as its symbol. Found in the oldest Korans as a chapter marker, here it is expressed fractally in Muhammad's tomb in Medina. 
The Eastern Orthodox Church used octagram star symmetry in numerous depictions of Christ Pantocrator and in the Transfiguration. Even the seemingly unrelated Aztec culture produced their calendrical Piedra del Sol having this remarkable symmetry. Finally, the Vatican also encoded this powerful symbol in St. Peter's Square. The ancient Egyptian obelisk at its center is literally a gigantic sundial with stones in the pavement marking the seasons. So the octogram star is resoundingly a solar symbol, appropriately fitting the male obelisk which is the primary reading of the Washington Monument. However, female energy is not entirely neglected in the Washington Monument. We've already seen how a stretched Vesica Pisces symbol surrounds the obelisk. Rick Campbell has brought something even more hidden to light. If you draw a Vesica Pisces to scale, with the circle's diameters equal to the height of the Washington Monument's 555 feet, the Great Pyramid of Egypt fits perfectly inside the vulva. This is no accident. The architect who designed the Washington Monument must have wanted to secretly link it with the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid and the Washington Monument both have phi in their proportions, which is one of the most interesting numbers in mathematics. The last thing I noticed in Washington, D.C. propelled me on a virtual journey around the world. Remember the pair of interlocking triangles surrounding the White House? It struck me that the horseshoe-shaped lawn in the White House backyard looked a lot like the bluestone ring at Stonehenge. That got me thinking how these two triangles together form a 5 by 12 rectangle that has the same proportions as the station rectangle at Stonehenge. Following this hunch, I drew a line from the tip of the federal triangle to the center of Stonehenge. Later on, I happened to zoom into New York City when this layer was on and saw that the alignment perfectly bisects Central Park. That's probably not an accident, so here we go. The angle that this large-scale alignment takes through Central Park matches the interlocking Pythagorean triangle's hypotenuses. Four such triangles match Central Park's proportions of 5 to 24 precisely. I then wondered, what is this unusual aqueduct doing just under the surface of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Reservoir? It seems to mirror the triangle's hypotenuse angle. That's certainly odd but in my research I've learned to follow so-called coincidences wherever they lead. The aqueduct leads us to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Getting closer still, we see this variation of the Templar flag in the atrium of the Robert Lehman collection. Incidentally, Albrecht Dürer's esoteric masterpiece, Melancholia I, is in this collection and we'll study it in Egypt. In case you're thinking I'm imagining connections where none exist, right outside this room is one of the oldest artifacts in North America, a 3,500-year-old Egyptian obelisk from Heliopolis. Note the octagon surrounding yet another solar symbol. There are only a handful of ancient Egyptian obelisks left in the world, even counting those still in Egypt. So when I see one, I sit up and take notice. This obelisk is the twin of Cleopatra's Needle in London. Egyptian temples typically had paired obelisks at their entrances, so the obelisks now in New York and London used to together frame the entrance to a temple in Heliopolis. It was quite a difficult and expensive project in the 19th century, and even today, to transport a 224-ton slab of granite halfway across the planet. Connecting nations with ancient Egypt was apparently a very powerful motivator to the Freemasons who bothered moving these obelisks. Overlaying the floor plan, we see what the aqueduct is pointing to, literally an ancient Egyptian temple within the Sackler wing of the Met. The Temple of Dender had to be removed from its original site in order to save it from being submerged by the construction of the Aswan High Dam. In 1965, the government of Egypt presented the temple as a gift to the United States, which was ceremonially represented by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. That's quite a coincidence, considering the aqueduct in Jackie's Reservoir 
led us to the very temple she received. Was the former First Lady playing the role of Isis? While we're in New York, let's take a look at one of the most famous tourist spots and greatest symbols of America and visit the Statue of Liberty. The authors Graham Hancock and Robert Bavall have researched the Statue of Liberty and you might be surprised what they have found. French sculptor and well-known Freemason Bartholdi designed the colossal statue originally for the opening of the Suez Canal in 1867. Fellow Freemason Gustave Eiffel, who was later made famous for his Parisian Tower, was commissioned as the statue's engineer. It is said Bartholdi modeled the sculpture after the Roman goddess Libertas. The truth is Libertas was an echo of the Egyptian goddess Isis. After Bartholdi's Colossus was rejected for the Suez Canal due to financial reasons, he repurposed it as the Statue of Liberty for New York Harbor. It comes as no surprise that the cornerstone for the Statue of Liberty was laid in a Masonic ceremony. Researcher Jim Allison has connected the dots and identified the triangle between Giza, Pharos, and the opening of the Suez Canal. The angle of this triangle matches the slope of the Great Pyramid and looks like the Greek letter Delta, which beautifully echoes the Nile Delta. The Colossus of Rhodes was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The giant statue that stood on the island of Rhodes depicted Apollo, god of the sun, who also wore a crown of seven rays. Seven rays is very interesting in light of the culmination of the initiation ceremony into the cult of Isis. According to 19th century author Edward Schur, after a successful initiate survived all the harrowing tests and triumphed over death by fire, water, and temptation of the senses, he was led into an inner sanctum where he looked upon a colossal metal statue of Isis, crowned with a diadem of seven rays. I believe seven is Isis's secret number. Isis's son Horus was god of the sun, just as Apollo depicted in the Colossus of Rhodes was god of the sun to the Greeks. You'll see that the Statue of Liberty's base star is quite odd, having eleven points. I think this was done to make the number symbolism in the Statue of Liberty fit an important Egyptian structure, the Great Pyramid of Giza, whose height to base proportion is 7 to 11, like the famous convenience store's name. And if you didn't get 11 from the base star, the height of the statue from heel to top of head is 111 feet 1 inch. So it all fits now. You see how the Statue of Liberty secretly depicts the Egyptian goddess Isis. Extending the line of the submerged structure in the reservoir that led us to the Temple of Isis all the way to the East River, we are directed to the United Nations headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. The iconic Secretariat's building proportions are based on phi. As you know, this proportion links the structure with the Washington Monument and the Great Pyramid. Did you know the 69,000 square meter site of UN headquarters is considered international territory and is technically not a part of New York City? The UN headquarters has its own security force, fire department, and postal administration that even issues its own stamps. The notion of UN headquarters being a city within a city reminds me of how the Vatican is also a city within Rome. I like to refer to this as a nested city or fractal structure. I was fascinated to discover that the Italian government donated an Arnaldo Pomodoro sphere within sphere sculpture to the UN in 1991. The golden ball beautifully represents the concept of a city within a city. The internal structures seem to me like buildings and streets on the inner surfaces of the spheres. I'm intrigued because I've seen three other similar sculptures in locations significant to my research. Pomodoro made a series of six spheres within spheres scattered around the world. Significant sphere within sphere locations are the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in DC, very close to the Capitol building, the de Young Museum in San Francisco, and in the Vatican's Courtyard of the Belvedere. 
we'll be visiting the latter two locations in due course. The Security Council Chamber is the emergency room of the UN, where decisions involving economic sanctions and military action are sometimes made. Notice the horseshoe-shaped desk surrounding 13 chairs located at a rectangular table in the center. The red chairs flanking the central group are arranged in rows of 13. All these lucky 13s are reminiscent of the many 13s on the Great Seal of the United States. The mural in the Security Council Chamber is by Norwegian artist Per Krog, and it contains some highly interesting symbolism. The left arched panel shows a woman opening a window, letting in rays of golden sunlight. The right arched panel shows a man letting a white horse run before the full moon. Sun and moon are symbolized in Masonic lodges by the columns Boaz on the left and Jachin on the right. Boaz and Jachin originally stood in Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Boaz symbolizes the sun and Jachin the moon. We'll see the symbolism again in the towers of sun and moon at Chartres Cathedral. The Vesica Pisces shape in the center of the mural contains the story of original sin. Young Adam and Eve stand in the background. Lucifer, hanging from serpentine vines in the tree of knowledge, hands Eve the infamous apple. Years pass, and Adam and Eve are shown with arms interlocked, closer to the center of the Vesica Pisces. In time, their firstborn Cain is shown in the foreground at his parents' feet. This unmistakable imagery is strange to say the least in a chamber representing all the nations of the world. The mural symbolizing the security of all nations should probably embrace all cultures and religions, but it clearly has a distinctly Judeo-Christian subtext. You have to look closely to perceive it, but there is a faint circle representing the sun surrounding the Vesica Pisces. Tiny flames can be seen emanating from this circle, which carry through four of the mural's panels. Here the sun, or sun, emerges from the center of the Vesica Pisces, or womb. The bird below the Vesica Pisces is a phoenix, standing over the ashes of its parent. The phoenix is a symbol of transformation and of the cyclical nature of time. Herodotus recorded the fact that this mysterious bird has ancient Egyptian provenance. There is a sacred bird called the phoenix. I have never seen it myself except in pictures, for it is extremely rare, only appearing according to the people of Heliopolis once in 500 years, when it is seen after the death of its parent. The beast of war is shown slain in an underground crypt, run through with a sword. The abandoned artillery, machine gun, and soldier laying down his rifle show this is the end of the Second World War. The UN was chartered at the end of this conflict in 1945, and therefore the war imagery is entirely appropriate. Souls, or shades in between life and death, literally in monochrome, are being helped up from below on both sides of the mural. Shades on the solar left side are tinted gold, and shades on the lunar right side are appropriately tinted silver. The original motto of the French Revolution, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, or La Mort, Liberty, Equality, Brotherhood, or Death, surprisingly maps to much of the remaining symbolism. Souls being lifted with ropes up into the light are gaining their liberty. The scene in the upper left shows a group of people weighing grain, presumably to distribute it with equality. The party in the two panels surrounding the Vesica Pisces illustrates brotherhood, with all types of people and children happily united holding cyan ribbons and UN flags. Those souls who died in the war are lining up and entering the starry door of death behind the phoenix. La Mort was later dropped from the revolutionary motto because it reminded people too much of the reign of terror. The tricolor flag of the French Republic symbolizes the three-term motto, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité. The scene in the upper right shows scientists investigating the macrocosm and microcosm with telescope and microscope. The two upper panels hold a political message, with the depiction of people painting, planting, designing, playing music, singing, writing, and dancing. I think the implication is humanity may enjoy these higher pleasures 
after war has been transformed like a phoenix into peace through the agency of the United Nations. The symbolism in the mural contains Judeo-Christian, Masonic, French Revolutionary, and ancient Egyptian imagery that became apparent only under careful analysis. The mural is more than a small decorative element. It dominates the Security Council chamber. Therefore, I think the choice of symbolism embedded in the mural tells us something about the character of the United Nations itself. I find the hidden connections to Masons and Egypt most provocative. Contemplating the United Nations got me thinking about national symbols. Consider the UN flag as a symbol of nations coming together in peace. As I already mentioned, the map is divided into 33 sectors. It seems appropriate that the earth is flanked by two olive branches symbolizing peace. Each of these branches contains 13 leaves. The UN flag is cyan in color and was created after the UN was chartered in 1945. In 1947, the UN decided to partition Palestine into a Jewish state, an Arab state, and a UN-administered Jerusalem. This decision led to a series of wars and ultimately Israel's independence in 1948. The coat of arms of Israel is also cyan in color. It seems appropriate that the menorah is featured because it's been a symbol of Judaism for almost 3,000 years. The menorah is flanked by two 13-leafed olive branches symbolizing peace, another parallel with the UN flag. There are many countries whose flags and coats of arms feature olive branches symbolizing peace. However, only the UN emblem and the coats of arms of Israel, the United States, and the U.S. Virgin Islands feature olive branches having exactly 13 leaves. The U.S. Virgin Islands coat of arms is a modified version of the Great Seal of the United States. The flag of the United States of America also features significant numerical symbolism. There are 13 red and white stripes. 50 stars are arranged in nine rows, alternating between rows of six and five stars. We'll learn the significance of the nine rows in San Francisco and the alternating rows of six and five stars in Egypt. Picking up the alignment that started at the tip of the Federal Triangle in D.C. through New York City's Central Park to its endpoint at the center of Stonehenge, we are wondering why would the Founding Fathers in D.C. and city planners in New York City conspire to link their fair cities with this ancient temple? The reason is simple. Stonehenge is at the heart of the mystery. Let's take a closer look. The first monument at the site was begun during the Neolithic period, around 3100 years before the Common Era, and Stonehenge was completed during the Bronze Age, approximately 4500 years ago. Here's a reconstruction of Stonehenge Phase 3 at its height, showing the sarsen ring with its stone lintels, huge trilithons, and smaller blue stones. The larger Aubrey Circle is a ring of 56 holes, accommodating four standing station stones. Connecting the station stones, we see what researchers call the station rectangle. The amazing thing is it has precisely the same 5 to 12 proportion as we've already seen in DC in New York City. Now we see where this proportion comes from, as this is surely the oldest known example. The astronomer Gerald Hawkins has shown how the station rectangle encodes specific astronomical phenomena, including cycles of Earth, Moon, and Sun, commemorated by important festivals in the Celtic calendar. Stuckley, one of the founders of the field of archaeology in the 18th century, whose great work was studying Stonehenge, claimed that Freemasonry was a legacy of the Druids, who in turn got their knowledge from the ancient Egyptians. The seven-pointed star inscribed within the Aubrey Circle clearly locates the Sarsen Ring and frames the horseshoe of trilithons and bluestones. After identifying seven as Isis's secret number in New York City, I'm wondering if this seven-pointed star isn't the star of Isis. The Egyptian civilization was at its height at the time of Stonehenge's completion, and although we have no archaeological evidence physically linking the two cultures, 
it remains an intriguing possibility. Avebury and Silbury Hill are a short distance from Stonehenge. Archaeologists say both of these monuments were built at the same time as Stonehenge, approximately 5,000 years ago. The late John Michel, said to be father of the Earth Mysteries, and surveyor and researcher Robin Heath, discovered amazing relationships between all three Neolithic monuments in terms of their precise locations upon the Earth. The base of Silbury Hill is 864,000 feet from the center of Stonehenge. The sun's diameter is 864,000 miles. The distance from 51 degrees north latitude to the latitude of Stonehenge measures 10.8 Egyptian royal miles. The mean radius of the moon is 1,080 miles. The latitude of Stonehenge is 17.28 miles from the latitude of Avebury. We learned in DC how 1728 symbolizes the cube. Avebury's latitude is precisely 360 divided by 7 degrees north. Dividing a circle into seven parts yields the Star of Isis. The placement of Stonehenge, Avebury, and Silbury Hill encode the numbers of the Sun, Moon, Cube, and Heptagram Star. Please measure these things yourself in Google Earth or with other methods. This hard metrological evidence should completely revise our understanding of prehistory. Early in the 20th century, archaeologists discovered a quarry in the Presley Hills where the bluestones used in Stonehenge were mined, approximately 130 miles from Stonehenge. Putting aside the practical issue of how the builders transported these large stones to the building site, let's focus instead on an even greater mystery. Heath had surveyed the distance from Stonehenge to an island due west in the Bristol Channel called Lundy. When Heath told Michelle that the distance from the center of Stonehenge to a small hill called the Tump at the center of Lundy Island was precisely the memorable number 123.4 statute miles, Mitchell recognized the number from his research, and then all the pieces quickly fit together. A statute mile is equal to 5,280 English feet and is still used to measure distances on roads in the United States. Michelle and Heath drew a triangle connecting Stonehenge, Lundy, and the Presley Mine. Two such matching interlocking triangles form a rectangle that has the same proportions as Stonehenge's station rectangle, and amazingly is exactly 2,500 times larger. This is the Greater Temple. What is more, the distances in the Lundy rectangle fit ancient Egyptian measure. Robin Heath's brother Richard pointed out in sacred number that 123.4 statute miles is precisely equal to 108 royal miles, the same unit that we've seen in Edinburgh and DC. This is no arbitrary distance, as 108 royal miles is 132nd of the polar radius of the Earth. The architects of Stonehenge must have chosen the building site in relation to an origin point originally selected at the center of Lundy Island. It's absolutely sublime the way Stonehenge resonates with the whole region and with the planet. As above, so below. 108 is a number sacred to many of the world's religions. For example, there are 108 prayer beads in the Holy Rosary. The Rosary is a key devotional path in the Catholic veneration of Mary. The worshiper's fingers keep track of the number of Hail Mary prayers they recite by moving along one bead at a time. Hindus, Buddhists, and Jains all use Japa Mala prayer necklaces in much the same way as Catholics. Incredibly, Japa Malas are most commonly made with exactly 108 beads. These two are fingered as the devotee chants or repeats mantras. Whether the worshipper is conscious of it or not, the moon is ultimately behind what they are actually venerating in 108 recitations. As I already mentioned, the mean radius of the moon is 1,080 miles. 
the connection between goddesses and the moon is as old as humanity. Coincidentally, the element silver, which has always been associated with the moon, has an atomic weight of 108 grams per mole. In the lost science of measuring the earth, Michel and Heath show how the English foot was derived from the earth's equatorial circumference. The distance around the equator equals 360,000 times 365.242 with incredible accuracy of 99.994% the current standard. This means the distance around the equator measured in English feet is the number of days in a year times the number of degrees in a circle times 1,000. Historians have lost track of when exactly the foot was invented in the mists of time, but you'll usually hear some tired anecdote about some old king's big foot. We can now confidently say that whoever defined the English foot knew the equatorial circumference of the earth with an accuracy in the thousandths of one percent. We only achieved this level of precision in earth measure in 1995 when the global positioning system or GPS became fully operational. Clearly we are not the first to achieve this level of technological sophistication. The mile is also based on the dimensions of the earth. There are 12 to the fifth divided by 10 miles in the meridian circumference of the earth. 528 is the resonant key that both defines the statute mile because 5,280 feet are equal to one mile and the central frequency of the ancient solfeggio, an ancient musical scale used in religious chanting. Metrology, the science of measurement, is one of the keys to decrypting the ancient mysteries. After all, the word geometry literally means earth measure, and virtually all ancient measurement systems were based upon the dimensions of the earth. As John Neal laid out in his groundbreaking book, All Done with Mirrors, which was subsequently expanded upon and popularized in books by John Michel and the Heath brothers, the English foot turns out to be the root of the ancient system wherein units designed to measure different scales were interrelated by fractional relationships. The way the ancient system used simple fractions is analogous to how the metric system uses powers of 10 to interconnect units used at different scales, such as millimeter, centimeter, kilometer, etc. As if these discoveries weren't enough, John Michel and Robin Heath stumbled upon yet another amazing find. There is an island just north of Lundy called Caldy, where there is a very old priory church built over an ancient Druid menhir. This island is located at the 2 to 3 point along the Presley Lundy edge of the figure. Musicians will recognize this proportion as the fifth, the most fundamental interval in music. If you draw a line connecting Stonehenge with the precise 2 to 3 point, roughly coincident with Caldy, you get the following proportion. If the Lundy Stonehenge line is 12, then the Caldy Stonehenge line is the square root of 153. Believe it or not, we'll see this cryptic number 153 again in the Louvre Pyramid and also in the Bible. So what's up with the square root of 153? Simple. It equals 12.369, the number of full moons in a year. So the proportions of the simple diagram encode cycles of sun, earth, and moon. This is far too much to be explained away by chance. However, Michel and Heath don't offer a theory as to how Neolithic tribespeople knew the precise size of the earth, surveyed such long distances, or understood subtle mathematical and astronomical relationships, living in what we know for certain to be an utterly primitive physical culture. Logically, one must consider the possibility that someone other than Neolithic tribespeople built Stonehenge. Michel and Heath's work sadly hasn't been accepted by the scientists of our times and is ridiculed as pseudoscience because their research has exposed how little we really understand about the origins of civilization. I, for one, urge you to keep an open mind and to weigh the evidence yourself using the scientific method. 
Academics today have little tolerance for theories that completely upset the apple cart if they wish to keep receiving funding. I don't have an unassailable theory either, but I will say that the builders of Stonehenge sure had some extraordinary architects directing their work. Fast forward four millennia from Stonehenge, and not far away Isaac Newton is hard at work in London on his theory of gravity. He's already invented calculus to cope with the mathematics, but now needs an accurate value for the size of the Earth so he can calculate its precise volume and thus fix his gravitational constant. Few realize that Newton was much more than a scientist. Today's scientists downplay the fact that their greatest hero was also a practicing alchemist, an art many today would consider pseudoscience. For example, Newton was the first to quantify temperature in 1700 with a scale that was based on the freezing and boiling points of water. I find it particularly interesting that Newton chose to measure his scale from 0 to 33 degrees. Conspiracy buffs are also aware of Newton being identified in the dossier's secrets as one of the grand masters of the Priory of Sion, an offshoot of the Templars. Whatever his reasons, Newton believed that the Great Pyramid's metrology encrypted the true dimensions of the Earth. John Greaves, professor of astronomy at the University of Oxford, surveyed the Great Pyramid just before Isaac Newton was born. Newton meticulously studied Greaves' work and based his own dissertations on ancient metrology on it. In 1637, Greaves made the most accurate survey of the Great Pyramid ever undertaken up to that point in history. He was the first to make the unlikely conclusion that the foot was at the root of the pyramid's measurements. To commemorate his discovery, Greaves inscribed a line inside the king's chamber, measuring precisely one English foot with the words, to be observed by all nations. The unfinished pyramid, that is without its absent pyramidian cap, measures exactly 480 English feet in height, which also happens to be precisely equal to one-eleventh of a mile. The width comes in at exactly 756 feet. Herodotus, the father of history, explained that the Great Pyramid was originally capped by a small model pyramid called a Pyramidian, which was sheathed in electrum, an alloy of gold and silver. Unfortunately, the valuable Pyramidian is long gone. Richard Heath's metrology shows the Great Pyramid's Pyramidian measured one and one-eleventh feet in height. This metallic cap would reflect the sun's light and look a lot like the shining eye on top of the U.S. dollar bill. The Great Pyramid is the sole surviving wonder of the ancient world. It remains the oldest, largest, and most accurate building ever built. It was the tallest structure in the world for four millennia. It is aligned within a tenth of a percent of true north, and its 13-acre base supporting 2.3 million blocks of stone is horizontal and flat to within 15 millimeters. The mean opening in joints between exterior casing stones is less than half a millimeter. The scale and accuracy are astounding. I believe that even with all the money in the world, we do not have the technical capability to replicate the Great Pyramid today. There is much to be said about the Great Pyramid's proportions. I've already mentioned how 7 to 11 was encoded in the Statue of Liberty. Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer used the half-triangle proportion of 14 to 11 in his esoteric masterpiece Melancholia I. Richard Heath has found the half-triangle also encodes 365 days to 20 moons, an interesting astronomical take on the mystery. Notice how pi and phi, two of the most important numbers in mathematics, are also implicated and interrelated in the pyramid proportions. John Charles Webb, Jr. has made a profound discovery about the location of the Great Pyramid that is unfortunately widely ignored because of its utter implausibility. Using Google Earth, we can measure the exact latitude of the center of the Grand Gallery inside the pyramid. It is 29.979-2458 degrees north. 
The speed of light in the vacuum is 299,792,458 meters per second. Incredibly, these are the same numbers. How can this be? This correlation is either pure coincidence or evidence of something very profound. The meter as unit of length and the practice of dividing time into seconds would have to be coordinated for the location of the Great Pyramid to encode the speed of light. Nothing may sound more improbable, but this is exactly the sort of numbers game that I think the ancients played. Consider the fact that one second is one earth rotation divided into 86,400 parts, because one day is equal to 86,400 seconds. Recall from the Stonehenge in San Francisco episodes that the sun's diameter is 864,000 miles, and 864 is the number of the sun. Perhaps the second and the mile were skillfully designed to express this beautiful harmony with the sun. The kilometer was originally defined by assuming the Earth's meridian circumference equals 40,000 kilometers. In Paris Part 3, you'll learn more about something I call the Canon of 400. For a taste, consider that during a solar eclipse, the moon perfectly covers the sun disk. The only reason this occurs so precisely is because the moon is exactly 400 times smaller than the sun, while at the same time the moon is 400 times closer to the earth than the sun. In addition, the earth turns 400 times faster than the moon. Perhaps saying the Earth has a meridian circumference of 40 million meters was no accident, as it's in the same number canon. I think the meter was secretly designed to resonate with the Sun. In fact, today the meter is circularly defined in terms of the speed of light, which is itself measured in meters per second. Consider the possibility that the meter is an ancient unit that was merely reintroduced 300 years ago during a time of great hermetic obsession in France. With these facts in mind, it is easier to see how disparate units based on our planet's source of light truly encode the speed of light using the location of the Great Pyramid itself. Our history books somehow miss the fact that architects at the dawn of history knew the speed of light in the vacuum and the exact size of the Earth with pinpoint accuracy. Perhaps the Great Pyramid was made before the Egyptian culture began, by different architects entirely. In 1964, Alex Badawi and Victoria Trimble discovered that shafts in the King's Chamber within the Great Pyramid pointed directly at a belt star in the Orion constellation, and the Pole Star at the time the pyramid was built. In 1993, Rudolf Gantenbrink got permission from the Egyptian authorities to send a robot up shafts in the Great Pyramid. He was able to accurately measure the exact shaft angles, and this data allowed Robert Bavall and Adrian Gilbert to run astronomical calculations showing precisely where the shafts in the King's and Queen's chambers are pointing to in the sky. In their 1995 book, The Orion Mystery, Bavall and Gilbert revealed that the shafts in the Queen's Chamber point directly to the star Sirius in the south, and to the Pole Star at the time the pyramid was built in the north. I can understand the Pole Star connection, because recognizing that stars rotate around the celestial pole is the most fundamental observation in astronomy. But why do the other shafts point to Orion and Sirius? The book Talisman by Graham Hancock and Robert Bavall sheds light on this mystery. Orion and Sirius represented Osiris and his consort Isis to the ancient Egyptians. They are in a region of the sky called the Duat, the Egyptian netherworld, where souls journeyed and were judged after death. Hieroglyphs in the 3400-year-old tomb of Tutmos III explain the benefits of copying the Duat upon the earth. Whoever shall make a copy of the Duat and shall know it upon earth, it shall act as a magical protector for him, both in heaven and in earth, unfailingly, regularly, and eternally. So the Egyptians believed building copies of Orion and Sirius upon the earth acted as magical talismans, bringing the power of heaven down to earth. 
we've certainly seen a much more recent example of this in Washington, D.C. The Orion constellation is often depicted as a hunter with a sword between his legs. Dan S. Ward of Alexandria.org says, No male wears a sword between his legs, and very few hunters carry a sword. Perhaps a more appropriate description of that which is hanging down below Orion's waist is that of a phallus. The area of Osiris's phallus contains the Orion Nebula, one of the most studied regions of space, because it is an incredibly generative area where stars are continually being formed. How appropriate! By the way, we are in the Orion Spur of the Milky Way galaxy, and Sirius is the brightest star in the sky by a wide margin because it is one of our nearest neighbors. We now have the astronomical knowledge to recognize we are actually quite close to the Duat. Bavall and Gilbert showed that the three pyramids of Giza actually have the same position and relative sizes as the belt stars of Orion. Dr. Gerhard Haney noticed that just as the belt stars of Orion point at Sirius, the pyramids point directly at Heliopolis, ancient center of Egyptian science, art, and religion which was a single unified body of knowledge in ancient times. Pythagoras, Plato, and many other ancient philosophers journeyed to Heliopolis, were initiated there in the Egyptian mysteries, and spread them in the West. Today the only thing that's left of this entire city is a single obelisk, which happens to be the oldest standing obelisk in the world. Incidentally, this single obelisk is all that's left of the ancient Temple of the Phoenix, which was described by Herodotus. I can't help but recall Phoenix imagery in the Security Council Chamber of the United Nations. It's amazing how many connections there are between the symbolism of the elite and ancient Egypt. You've already heard about one Heliopolitan obelisk next to the Met in New York City, and its pair on the Victoria Embankment in London. Rome has the remainder of the Heliopolitan obelisks left in the world. Heliopolis was the cult center for the nine great Egyptian gods, collectively called the Ennead. We'll learn more about the Ennead in San Francisco. In the first decade of the 20th century, G. I. Gurdjieff went on a mystical journey where he met with a number of remarkable men. At Mount Athos in Greece, he was supposedly entrusted with the key to decoding ancient Egyptian knowledge preserved by the Sufi Sarmang Brotherhood. The key he received is the Enneagram and the means to decipher it. The Enneagram is the fundamental hieroglyph of a universal language. All knowledge can be included in the Enneagram, and with the help of the Enneagram, it can be interpreted. Gurdjieff's philosophy was popularized by his pupil Ospensky, and through him the Enneagram found its way into modern psychology. The Enneagram of Personality is a typology described by Riso and Hudson that's used in business, psychotherapy, arts, education, and for spiritual development. The Baha'i Faith correspondingly uses a nine-pointed star as its symbol. Baha'i scripture specifies that every house of worship must feature a nine-sided great room. There is even a Christian connection. In the ninth book of the New Testament, St. Paul wrote, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Here is the traditional depiction of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, shown with first letters in Latin. It's another nine-pointed star. With these things in mind, let's explore the sacred geometry of San Francisco. Believe it or not, San Francisco is steeped in Egyptian symbolism. The original Michael H. de Young Museum that was built in 1894 had an Egyptian theme, complete with an under-pyramid entrance that anticipated the recent addition to the Louvre. The museum was unfortunately destroyed in the 1906 earthquake, and the de Young Museum is presently in its third incarnation. However, the two sphinxes that flank the original museum's entrance are still there. The Transamerica Pyramid is a landmark worldwide and is the most famous building in the city. But the Transamerica Pyramid neither houses the headquarters of the Transamerica Corporation 
nor is it really a pyramid. Does it remind you of an obelisk? It's clearly not a true obelisk, because it's not carved out of a single piece of granite, and the elevator core protrudes out of the sides of the structure. But we can see beyond this modern necessity to perceive its symbolism. The height of the 1972 structure is commonly cited at 853 feet, but this figure doesn't include the glass pyramidian cap and its mast. Adding the additional 11 feet brings the total up to 864 feet, making this the tallest obelisk in the world, far exceeding the Washington Monument's 555 feet. And 864 is a very interesting number indeed. As you learned at Stonehenge, the sun's diameter happens to be 864,000 miles. In addition, there are exactly 86,400 seconds in a day. By making the Transamerica Pyramid 864 feet high, the architect was clearly making it a solar symbol. The glass pyramidian cap contains a brilliant light that shines forth on July 4th. In addition to it being U.S. Independence Day, July 4th is also Aphelion, the day the Earth is farthest from the Sun in its yearly cycle. The Transamerica Pyramid occupies a privileged site in the streets of San Francisco. It marks the endpoint of Columbus Avenue, which cuts across the street grid at a 40-degree angle. It's funny, but I recognize the significance of this 40-degree angle immediately because I'd just been hired by an architect to make a 3D model of his nine-sided atrium. This incredible synchronicity is what allowed me to make the next discovery. When I overlaid a nine-sided figure on the streets of San Francisco, here is what I found. The Transamerica Pyramid fits at this vertex. Columbus Avenue runs along this edge. The grid of streets matches this edge's 40-degree turn. And most significantly, it appears that Treasure Island was designed to fit this figure. Treasure Island was completed in 1937 in time for the Golden Gate International Exposition. The U.S. Navy controversially seized Treasure Island from the city of San Francisco during World War II. The Navy built the unusual star-shaped barracks in the approximate location of the tower that had been torn down after the Expo in 1937. The barracks also happened to be exactly at the midpoint of this edge of the diagram. While I'm not certain what the barracks symbolize, their shape and position does seem significant. Masonic author Albert Churchward says the hieroglyph of the risen sun god Horus looks like this. Also, six triangles and hieroglyphs means land of the spirits. In any case, the Navy base was recently decommissioned, and Treasure Island is now open to the public. I went there to find the barracks abandoned but the strange symbolism remains, at least for a little while longer. There is currently a plan in the works to build a large mixed-use development on Treasure Island. The plan, scheduled to be completed in 2022, calls for a 650-foot-tall sun tower to be constructed where the star-shaped barracks are today. Coincidentally, the single bus line that serves Treasure Island is Route 108. Again, in the Stonehenge segment, you learned why 108 symbolizes the moon. So in a few years, you'll be able to ride the moon bus to the Sun Tower. In the Great Pyramid segment, we studied the Ennead, or pantheon of the nine ancient Egyptian gods worshipped at Heliopolis, the city of the sun. When we layer the Ennead over the nine-sided figure, we see the correlation between the solar Transamerica Pyramid and the phallic obelisk of Osiris. When I turned on the terrain layer in Google Earth, Telegraph Hill poked up through the Ennead layer, so I started researching Coit Tower. It was designed by Arthur Brown Jr. in 1933, after Brown designed three buildings in the Federal Triangle, which you'll remember figured prominently in the secret architecture of Washington, D.C. The octagonal top of Coit Tower fits within the octogram star, which you saw in Washington, D.C. Part 2, is a classic solar symbol. Do you think this is coincidental? 
There were four pairs of male and female gods in the oldest Egyptian creation myth which predated the Ennead. The Ogdoad, as the eight gods were known, was venerated in Hermopolis, the city of Hermes. Hermes was his Greek name, Mercury was his Roman one, while both names echo Thoth, source of the Egyptian wisdom. All of these names supposedly reference the same immortal figure who dispensed wisdom to humanity at different points in history. The subtle arcs along the sides of the structure suggest the interlocking circles of the vesica Pisces, which represents the female genitals. Perhaps not surprisingly, and just like the Washington Monument, Coit Tower symbolizes the act of coitus, or the sacred union of Isis and Osiris. Hancock and Bival have well documented in their book Talisman how Thoth's knowledge base was passed down through the Gnostics, Manichees, Bogomils, and Cathars. All were ruthlessly wiped out by the Catholic Church. Any remaining followers were then completely annihilated by the Inquisition. Thankfully, the popes weren't entirely successful in instituting a permanent Dark Age, because a century after the Inquisition, Cosimo de' Medici recovered the Corpus Hermetica, which was written in the first century in Alexandria. This older stream of hermetic knowledge that escaped the burning of the Library of Alexandria actually fueled the Italian Renaissance, and then went underground in secret societies that persist to this day. The Golden Gate is neither golden, nor is it literally a gate. Instead, it's the Red Bridge built the same year as Treasure Island. Known throughout the world as an engineering marvel and symbol of San Francisco, it also represents the fulfillment of manifest destiny, the 19th century belief in the inexorable expansion of the United States from sea to shining sea. Here's a 19th century painting depicting the goddess Columbia leading settlers westward in an allegorical representation of manifest destiny. The Golden Gate is actually a concept from, you guessed it, ancient Egypt. Are you seeing the pattern here? They believe the Golden Gate was the threshold souls must pass after death on their way to the Duat. You might be interested they also spoke of a silver gate, guarded by Isis, the great mother of the sun. Souls passing through the silver gate on their journey from the divine source are incarnated upon the earth. I think Treasure Island represents the Silver Gate guarded by Isis. Its seven sides certainly have her number. Perhaps the gift of incarnation itself is the treasure. The soul journeys westward like the American settler and passes over Alcatraz, one of the world's most famous prisons. This fits with the Cathar belief that the body is the prison of the soul. All the while angels, this is Angel Island, fly above in a higher dimension. Angel Island is a state park and has incomparable views of the bay. The adjacent peninsula is the town of Belvedere, one of the highest income places in the United States. There may be a few angel investors in Belvedere who take in the incredible scenery and its symbolism. After doing time upon the earth, the soul passes through the Golden Gate to meet its destiny in the Duat. Now we're way out there. Let's fly back to Giza and get back down to Earth. The pyramids of Giza are said to be located in the middle of the Earth. Jim Allison is an independent researcher who's uncovered some mind-blowing geometry. Here he's taken the Vesica Pisces and laid it over the circle of the Earth. Giza is at this point, equidistant from the North Pole and the center of the Earth quite a central location when you see it this way. In one of the oldest surviving hermetic fragments called the Kore Cosmu, or Virgin of the World, Isis has this to say to her son Horus. But the right holy land of our ancestors lies in the middle of the earth, and the middle of the human body is the sanctuary of the heart, and the heart is the headquarters of the soul, and that, my son, is the reason why men of this land are more wise. It could not be otherwise, seeing they are born and bred upon Earth's heart. The heart of Egypt would have to be the Great Pyramid, and it embodies many more secrets. Let's investigate a few more. 
Here I've superimposed two instances of the same 3D model. When we draw a circle from the center of the pyramid in plan to the tip of the pyramid in elevation, something amazing happens. We square the circle. The circumference of the circle is equal to the perimeter of the square. This is a sacred diagram that encodes much wisdom. Mathematicians have proven this diagram can't be drawn perfectly because of the transcendental nature of pi. Approximations are all that is possible in flat Euclidean space. In the book The Dimensions of Paradise, John Michel has shown how the first Pythagorean triplet is the key to the wisdom encoded in this diagram. Here, three, four, five triangles set the scale and make it a very easy approximation for anyone to draw with compasses and a ruler. Now brace yourself for the wisdom. The moon and earth actually fit this diagram. The size of the moon compared to the earth is as 3 is to 11 with a 99.97% accuracy. The pyramid therefore encodes the relative sizes of moon and earth. The 3-4-5 triangle itself contains a secret that unlocks yet more of the mystery. The area of a 3-4-5 triangle is 6. 6 is one of very few perfect numbers in math and is the only number in the infinite sea of numbers which is both the sum and product of the same three numbers. The number 6 is associated with the macrocosm, which is everything in the universe larger than the human scale. There's a simple mathematical realization that gets you from 6 to 720 that I'll skip over here. Pause the video if you love numbers. When you scale the original diagram by 720, here's what you get the actual dimensions of the moon and earth in miles. The diagram says the earth's diameter is 7920 miles and that's 99.97 percent accurate. The diagram says the moon's diameter is 2160 miles and that's 99.94 percent accurate. That's one precise approximation. John Michel called these the canonical numbers for a good reason. When we lay this diagram over Stonehenge, we see that it fits. The dimensions of Stonehenge match the canonical numbers, but with a shifted decimal place and in English feet rather than in miles. St. Mary's Chapel in Glastonbury is another structure Michelle has found that fits the canonical numbers in English feet. According to the legend, St. Joseph of Arimathea left Jerusalem after the crucifixion and traveled to the Druid Isle of Avalon where he built the first Christian church. This was later rebuilt as St. Mary's Chapel in the 12th century. Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned in all four Gospels as the wealthy man who donated his own prepared tomb that became the Holy Sepulchre. Some say Joseph of Arimathea was Jesus' uncle because he acted like a family member in this regard. In any case, these are the walls that remain from St. Mary's Chapel, and here are its dimensions in English feet. The dimensions fit the canonical numbers, just like Stonehenge. The original chapel's ground plan resonates with a double vesica Pisces like we saw in the analysis of the Great Seal of the United States. Thinking of the legend, I overlaid a 5 by 12 rectangle with X's inside that we'll see later in Jerusalem and I discovered that it closely fits the double Vesica Pisces. Perhaps there is truth to the legend of St. Joseph of Arimathea after all. St. Mary's seems to bear the stamp of the Jerusalem rectangle. If shifting the decimal place in the canonical numbers doesn't matter, then there must be something special about the decimal system. Consider Pythagoras's motto, All is Number. The most sacred symbol in the Pythagorean secret worship of number was the tetractus. The diagram consists of points arranged in four rows, with one, two, three, and four points in each successive row. The tetractus symbolizes the four elements, encodes pure musical intervals, is the seed for understanding the harmony of the cosmic spheres, and represents the structure of space itself. The sum of the points in the tetractus is 10. 
The decimal system we use today, known as base 10, utilizes nine digits plus zero as a placeholder. In fact, the word digit comes from the Latin digitus, which means finger. We naturally assume base 10 must have arisen from the practice of counting on fingers. Peter Plichta, who is both a physicist and a chemist, has shown in his book, God's Secret Formula, that there is much more to the decimal system beyond the physiology of our hands. Believe it or not, the decimal system hinges on the number 81. To understand this, bear with me for a moment and see how all the numbers in the decimal system are hiding under 81. Starting with the decimal point, line up all the numbers sequentially like this. The numbers beyond 9 are shown in parentheses because they are not yet in the decimal place system of single digits. Carrying each parenthesized digit into the decimal system yields a repeating decimal. This infinitely repeating number is equal to the reciprocal of 81. All the numbers really are hiding under 81. This is especially significant because there are exactly 81 stable elements in the universe. No more, no less. The periodic table of the elements lists the elements beyond 83 as subject to radioactive decay, but most are unaware of the fact that unstable elements 43 and 61 don't exist anywhere in the universe unless they are synthesized. Plichta was the first to make this connection and also points out that all 81 stable elements are categorized into 10 types of isotopes which is another reference to the decimal system. So Pythagoras was right. All is number, and the numbers are in base 10. Rena Shesso's book, Math for Mystics, points out some relevant spooky facts. Not only does the moon move through space 81 times faster than the Earth, but the moon has 181st the mass of Earth. Am I alone in thinking this is just too perfect? She also points out that the magic square of the moon is a 9 by 9 square having 81 numbers. Magic squares go back at least 2600 years to ancient China. I get the feeling all of this was known in the distant past. While kids count to 10 on their fingers, theoretical physicists talk about 10 dimensional superstrings, and Kabbalists talk about 10 sephiro on the tree of life. They are all recounting the decimal structure of the universe from different points of view. Traveling a short distance along the Nile, we come to Dashur, site of the lesser-known Red and Bent Pyramids. Egyptologists claim these were contemporaneous with the Great Pyramid of Giza. I think the sacred geometry of both pyramids was correctly deciphered at world-mysteries.com. The pyramids at Dashur hold keys to macrocosm and microcosm. First of all, the Red Pyramid isn't as steep as the Great Pyramid. Its face proportions match this red triangle within a pentagram. Tilting up four such triangles until they meet defines the pyramid and its slope. The pentagram is a powerful magical talisman that was a symbol of the Pythagorean school. The pentagram encodes the golden number phi within itself fractally. Phi is one of the most important numbers in mathematics because nature uses it to proportion everything from pine cones to sunflowers and nautilus shells. Even our bodies are based on the golden section. The number five is associated with the microcosm, with life and in the growth of living things. The adjacent bent pyramid is the only pyramid with two slope angles. The lower slope is steeper than the Great Pyramid and its face proportions match this blue triangle within a hexagon. Tilting up four such triangles until they meet defines the pyramid's lower slope. The upper slope matches the Red Pyramid, so it's red triangles within pentagons again here. So what's up with all the hexagons and pentagons? It has been said that the great enigma of alchemy is the mystery between macrocosm and microcosm. The word alchemy actually comes from alchemy, which means the way of Egypt. I believe relating 6 to 5 is the essential key encoded at Dashur. 
Renaissance master Albrecht Dürer made this drawing in his course in the art of measurement with compasses and a ruler. Everything emerges from the Vesica Pisces. Dürer's Melancholia I is one of the most studied pieces of esoteric art. Franz Deckwitz presented the following analysis in 1979 to John Michel, who published it in his 1988 book, The Dimensions of Paradise. The opening of the compasses is the key to the engraving's metrology. The compasses, sphere, measuring stick, and overall proportions all fit the same unit. As already mentioned, the engraving's proportions of 14 to 11 match the Great Pyramid's half-triangle proportion. The objects in the engraving are packed with hermetic symbolism, but the most interesting thing to me is the hidden controlling geometry. It's the alchemical wedding of pentagon and hexagon. Schwaller de Lubix did this study of an Egyptian gateway. Notice the proportions of sixes and fives in the opening, and the octave height of two compared to the overall width of a fundamental one. Henry Lincoln co-wrote Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which became an inspiration for Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, published more than 20 years later. In the holy place, Lincoln revealed what he calls a structured landscape in the former Cathar country surrounding the mysterious village of Rennes-le-Chateau. Again we see the marriage of six and five. The pentagram over the cube in DC is another representation of six and five coming together. Recall how triple sixes and fives are encoded in the Washington Monument as 6,660 inches equals 555 feet. America's monumental obelisk therefore expresses the relationship between macrocosm and microcosm. Moving to a larger scale, the Earth encodes 6 to 5 in temporal and spatial terms. The Earth's precessional cycle measured in years, divided by the Earth's equatorial circumference measured in nautical miles, is precisely equal to 6 divided by 5. Alex B. Geddes discovered relationships in the solar system that express the macrocosm's relationship to the microcosm. These are published in John Martineau's superb Little Book of Coincidence. The relationships Geddes found are ratios between the products of mean orbital radii of planets in our solar system. More specifically, the ratios each equal 6 divided by 5, plus a small factor that must be added in each case to balance the equalities. Each product is a symmetrical relationship between inner rocky planets and outer gas giants. I notice that each one of the factors added to balance the equalities encodes 864, the same number you learned in the Stonehenge and San Francisco episodes is the number of the Sun. How incredibly apropos! In mathematics, phi and pi are two of the most important numbers. They can be related in the following way. 6 divided by 5 times phi squared equals pi. This equation is an extremely accurate approximation, but is not exact, and as such is classified by mathematicians as a coincidence. Are all of these things just pure coincidence or evidence of hyperdimensional resonance? For a more complete answer to that, you'll have to wait for the Paris episodes. For the next astonishing example of sixes over fives, we'll visit the holy city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is one of the oldest cities in the world having been continuously inhabited for close to six millennia. The old walled city that occupies an area of less than one square kilometer is sacred in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the most sacred place in Christianity, where Jesus was both crucified and entombed before rising from the dead. The site where Solomon's and Herod's temples were located is actively debated. The only thing the researchers seem to agree upon is that it was somewhere on the Temple Mount. Locating the Temple precisely is a priority for Jews, 
because the rock of foundation within the temple's Holy of Holies is the most sacred place in Judaism. For centuries it has been assumed that this rock is the same stone whereupon Abraham nearly sacrificed Isaac, and from which Muhammad ascended into heaven, namely the bedrock upon which the Dome of the Rock stands today. You can see in this cutaway how the Sufi shrine was built to worship this bedrock. My favorite theory comes from Dr. Asher Kaufman in 1991. He claims that the Jewish foundation stone is located just north of the Dome of the Rock, in a small section of exposed bedrock currently under the diminutive Dome of the Tablets. The echo of tablets in the dome's name is actually circumstantial evidence suggesting correlation with the tablets of the Ten Commandments. These most famous tablets were stored in the Ark of the Covenant, which of course was located within the Holy of Holies within Solomon's Temple. However, the main reason I subscribe to this theory is that it fits the larger geometry of the city, as proposed by John Michel and Christine Rohn in their book Twelve Tribe Nations. Michel and Rohn have drawn a 5 by 12 rectangle over Jerusalem, matching the proportion of rectangles we've studied all over the world. The Jerusalem rectangle is anchored in the ancient Jaffa Gate, an opposite city wall corner point here. Its right edge parallels the Temple Mount. Richard Heath showed in Sacred Number that when we draw equal X's within the rectangle, the crossing points pass directly over the Rock of Calvary inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus was crucified, and over the Jewish Rock of Foundation under the Dome of the Tablets. In other words, these X's precisely mark the holiest spots in Christianity and Judaism. Measuring the rectangle uncovers something more. The length is equal to 1,728 cubits of 1.728 feet each. That's a double reference to the number we learned in Washington, D.C. symbolizes a cube. In Judaism, the Holy of Holies within Solomon's Temple had very specific proportions as described in the Torah. It was a cube measuring 20 cubits on each side. The holiest spot in Islam is Mecca. More specifically, it is the Kaaba within Mecca, which all Muslims are supposed to visit at least once in their lives. Kaaba means cube. Indeed, the object of their veneration is a giant black cube. The word Kabbalah, which means knowledge in Jewish mysticism, also references a cube. In Greek mythology, Apollo and Artemis were born on the small island of Delos. As the story goes, the citizens of Delos consulted the oracle at Delphi to learn how to defeat a plague sent by Apollo. The oracle responded that they must double the volume of their cubic altar to Apollo. This rather difficult problem involving the cube root of two was known as the Delian problem in mathematics which was later solved by the Pythagorean philosopher Archytas. Why are so many of the most important places symbolized by cubes? Recall that the cubit that measures Jerusalem is 1.728 English feet exactly. 1.728 is equal to 6 over 5 raised to the third power. I suggest you do the math to verify this is so. Come to think of it, the word cubit clearly comes from the word cube. So Jerusalem is symbolized by the volume of a cube whose edge length relates macrocosm to microcosm. If you dimension the Jerusalem rectangle in this way, with two depictions of 6 and 5, you'll see the X's themselves as representations of the great enigma of alchemy, namely the relationship between 6 and 5. Perhaps not surprisingly, the cubit that measures 1.728 English feet is actually the canonical Egyptian cubit. Author Ahmed Osman puts forward the controversial but never refuted theory that Moses was actually the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten. Both were powerful monotheists who were educated in Egypt. It's certainly a theory worth contemplating. Many of the most significant events in Jesus' life are lined up along an axis. 
First of all, Jesus spent time teaching his disciples on the Mount of Olives. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday through this oldest of gates in Jerusalem's city walls, called the Golden Gate in Christian tradition. I can't help but think of the bridge in San Francisco. Here's Giotto's depiction of Mary's parents, Joachim and Anne, meeting at the Golden Gate. In Jewish tradition, this same gate is the one through which the Messiah will enter Jerusalem at some unknown point in the future. However, Suleiman the Magnificent sealed off the Golden Gate in 1541 literally to prevent the Messiah's entrance, and the Golden Gate and Temple Mount remain under Islamic control today. As you know, this tension between Muslims and Jews has persisted up to the present day. Jesus upset the money changers' tables in Herod's temple here, if we accept the Kaufman theory as to the location of the second temple. The Garden of Gethsemane is the place where Jesus prayed the night before his crucifixion. This is the place where he is said to have sweat drops of blood. As tradition has it, the crucifixion happened at Calvary, and his body was placed in the Holy Sepulchre just a few dozen feet away. Isn't it amazing that most of the important events in Christianity took place along an axis connecting the center of the axis in this diagram? Before we leave Jerusalem, I want to detour to a place you'd probably never expect me to go. Winnipeg, Canada. It's the capital of Manitoba, eh? Architectural historian Frank Albo has discovered the Manitoba Legislative Building is not only a reconstruction of Solomon's Temple, but is loaded with secrets in plain sight. The architect Frank Worthington Simon designed this 1920 building to be veiled in allegory and illustrated with symbols only his Freemasonic brothers would understand. In fact, every premier who worked in this building from 1870 to 1967 was a Freemason. Two Egyptian sphinxes flank the entrance just as they do in front of the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. The top of the dome features a 13-foot-high gilded statue of Mercury, the same golden boy we'll meet again in Paris. After going up two flights of 13 steps, one enters a cubic space measuring 66.6 .6 feet on edge. We'll uncover the unexpected meaning of 666 in the most surprising of places in Paris. It's probably not what you think. According to Albo's research, two 13-foot-high bronze bisons identify this as a cleansing room in temple vernacular. Going up another flight of 13 steps, one arrives in the rotunda. There's a mural on the wall of the rotunda above the entrance to the Manitoba Legislative Assembly that ostensibly depicts World War I. However, a man wearing a white robe with exposed chest, being supported by his brother, identifies him as an initiate in the first Masonic degree ceremony. Albo identifies this mural as the altar in what is secretly an initiation chamber. Looking up in the rotunda, you see the underside of the central dome the golden boy is perched upon, and looking down a level through an oculus in the floor, reveals a fascinating space called the Pool of the Black Star. Just off the rotunda is the Lieutenant Governor's reception suite, which is the only space in the building off-limits to the public. Albo got special permission to measure the chamber, and discovered it's a cube, having an edge length of 20 cubits. These are precisely the same dimensions as the Holy of Holies within Solomon's Temple a place that was also obviously off-limits to the public. But if this represents the Holy of Holies within Solomon's Temple, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Albo discovered it's directly above this suite on the building exterior. The war chest, as it's known, is flanked by two warriors, which one can accurately identify as Raiders of the Lost Ark. This building is clearly amazing, but why is it here? Albo points out that Winnipeg is at the geographical center of North America. The black star at the heart of the legislative building was deliberately placed upon this naval point. Okay, but what is the building really doing? 
I think the Manitoba Legislative Building was designed as a magical talisman to harvest or in some sense control the energies of North America. Consider a much older example of this type of talismanic magic. Old Sarum, which is the center point of ley lines in England, dates from the same era as Stonehenge, Avebury, and Silbury Hill. This radiating topology reminds me of one other magical artifact, the sun disk worshipped during the reign of King Tut's father, the pharaoh Akhenaten. If you think believing in magic is childish, consider Walt Disney's so-called Magic Kingdom. Did you know Disneyland has a mysterious Club 33, which is not open to the general public? We know from studying DC how important the number 33 is to Masons. Club 33 memberships cost $20,000, and it's the only place in Disneyland where alcohol is served. There's clearly more going on in the Magic Kingdom than meets the eye. I think the black star at the center of North America holds a much deeper secret. Physicist Nassim Haramein, whom you'll hear more about in Rome, believes that Moses took a compact power source out of the Great Pyramid and placed it inside the Ark of the Covenant before he left Egypt. Haramein showed how the Ark fits precisely within the misnamed sarcophagus inside the king's chamber within the Great Pyramid. It was misnamed because no mummy has ever been found in an Egyptian pyramid. By the way, the granite box's exterior volume is exactly double its interior volume, a mathematical relationship echoed thousands of years later in the Delian problem that plagued the Greeks. Considering the evidence, I think the Ark was an Egyptian artifact before it became the most sacred object in Judaism. In any case, Haramein believes the power source inside the Ark was a mini black hole. During their exodus from Egypt, the Bible says the Israelites followed a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Haramein claims the mini black hole stored in the Ark would have produced just such a fiery vortex rising like a pillar. Haramein's physics show that stars are really black holes under a mantle of trapped matter. Sunspots are black because they literally are vortices in the mantle that expose the black hole inside the sun. The pool of the black star reveals this great cosmic secret to those who can decode the secrets in plain sight. Perhaps there is nowhere else in the world with more layers of history and symbolism than Jerusalem. I can think of no better example of this than in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Its architecture is a patchwork made from so many untold layers. Calvary Chapel is built on the first foot or so of the rock upon which Jesus is said to have been crucified. Excavation that took place in 1973 revealed a chapel some fifteen feet under this rock, called the Tomb of Adam, where the first human skull is said to be visible in the rock face. In fact, the term Calvary comes from the Latin Calvariae locus, which is Golgotha in Greek, or place of the skull in English. Prior to the first Christian emperor, Constantine the Great, repurposing this site as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it had been a temple of Venus, before the Romans worshipped Venus, she was known in the Greek world as Aphrodite. And if we dig deeply enough, we find yet another layer on top of the Egyptian Isis. The notion of Christianity layering Egyptianism is nothing new. Here is Albrecht Dürer's Renaissance depiction of the Man of Sorrows by the Column. Note Christ's unmistakable Egyptian crook and flail posture. This is Dürer's secret depiction of Christ as Osiris, the resurrected God. Dürer then shows Christ being flagellated with said symbols in this later etching. Here is Osiris with his characteristic crook and flail in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Osiris as Lord of the Dead presides over the weighing of souls ceremony. Anubis measures the dead man's heart on the scale against Mott's feather of truth. Her husband Thoth, scribe of the gods, records the result. If the heart is lighter than the feather, Horus will present the man's soul to Osiris in the Duat. 
but if not, it will be devoured by the deadly Amet, the monster who was part crocodile, lion, and hippopotamus. Mott is currently personified as Lady Justice, holding scales and sword. Lady Justice adorns courthouses around the world. Here she is in the old Supreme Court chamber in the U.S. Capitol. The scales of justice were also used in Christianity in the Last Judgment. Here are 15th century depictions, showing souls being weighed and judged. The beasts of hell certainly recall the terror inspired by Amit. Spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead lists what later became the Ten Commandments in Judeo-Christian theology. Everything goes back to Egypt. If you ask someone off the street where the holiest spot in Christianity is, you probably won't hear the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Most will think of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The word Peter literally means rock, and when Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, Simon became Peter. Thinking on all the rocks I'd been studying in Jerusalem, it was natural for me to draw a line from the rock of Golgotha to the tomb of St. Peter in Rome. Here we go again. The line connecting Golgotha with the tomb of St. Peter passes directly over the center of the Campidoglio, marked today by the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. What we see in the Campidoglio is Michelangelo's vision for the top of the Capitoline Hill, the ancient world's original capital. It took a Renaissance genius to symbolically turn the Roman power equation on its head. So instead of having the Capitoline face the ancient Roman Forum as it had for two millennia, Michelangelo turned the Campidoglio 180 degrees to face the Vatican. The Campidoglio's paving pattern depicts a 12-pointed elliptical star, symbolizing a zodiac with the sun at the center. It is my contention that this long-distance alignment was originally drawn to connect the seat of power in Rome with the Temple of Venus in Jerusalem. In the Christian era, the tomb of St. Peter in the Vatican was strategically located to be a continuation in line with this ancient axis. It is no secret that Christian churches were often built atop places of ancient worship. In this way, pagan shrines were Christianized and their power absorbed into the body of the church. See how the alignment goes directly over the arch of Septimus Severus? The line passes only a few feet away from the umbilicus urbis Romae, the navel stone from which all distances in the Roman Empire were measured. All roads that led to Rome symbolically arrived here. Following the alignment through the Forum, we see that it goes through the center of the Roman Colosseum, where among other pastimes, spectators enjoyed gladiatorial combat and watching Christians being fed to the lions. This shape in the center of the Colosseum bowl suggests the Vesica Pisces. Could this be a symbol of Venus? If so, what went on in the Colosseum somehow became the opposition of the love and beauty associated with Venus. The last stop on our alignment tour is the largest ancient Egyptian obelisk in the world, including all of those still standing in Egypt. The alignment from Jerusalem passes directly over the tip of this 230-ton symbol in front of the Lateran. As you may have guessed, obelisks are one of the keys to unlocking the ancient mysteries. This obelisk wasn't always in front of the Lateran. It originally came from the Temple of Karnak in Egypt and was moved to Rome by Constantine the Great's son in the 4th century. The last of the Renaissance popes, Sixtus V, moved the obelisk from where it had been in the Circus Maximus to the Lateran, displacing the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, which as you know was moved to the Campidoglio. Now Sixtus V was a very singular pope. As is the custom when a pope dies, the new pope chooses a name for himself. I find it fascinating that Felice Peretti di Montalto chose a name referencing both six and five in Sixtus V. The fact is, Sixtus V redesigned much of Rome during his brief five-year reign. He considered moving the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem to Rome, but the logistics proved to be too much. 
He did, however, succeed at moving four gigantic Egyptian obelisks within Rome, completing the Dome of St. Peter's, opening six streets, building fourteen fountains, and much more. Roman emperors were the first to raid Egypt in antiquity for its obelisks. By repositioning these obelisks in Renaissance Rome, Sixtus V was motivated by something other than Catholicism. Researchers Jan Witcherink and Aaron Parlier reveal much of what Sixtus V was up to. The red line shows a pair of obelisks aligned to the summer solstice sunrise. The blue line shows another pair of obelisks aligned to the winter solstice sunrise. Sixtus V placed Egyptian obelisks in St. Peter's Square and in the Piazza del Popolo exactly as they are to create the red astronomical alignment. He engaged in a bit of urban renewal by opening a straight street connecting the ancient Roman obelisks at the top of the Spanish steps and in front of Santa Maria Maggiore to make the blue astronomical alignment visible. Balancing the masculine symbol of the obelisk, Sixtus V restored an ancient aqueduct and built fountains symbolizing the feminine to accompany most obelisks. Four fountains mark the crossing of the blue and yellow lines connecting the Fontana de Dioscuri and the Aqua Felice, all watery creations of Sixtus V. The green line connecting the Vatican obelisk with the four fountains marks equinoctial sunrise. Sixtus V's tomb in the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore was his final gesture, linking his tomb with the astronomical alignments he set up in Rome. Why was Sixtus V obsessed with astronomical symbolism? Perhaps because astronomy is another key to the ancient mysteries. In addition to the solar symbolism mentioned in the Washington, D.C. Part 2 episode, Bernini's redesign of St. Peter's Square has a deeper reading. Witcherink and Parlier claim the two fountains flanking the obelisk represent a liquid axis symbolizing the galactic midplane of the Milky Way. The axis going through the basilica is the ecliptic, and the other four paths represent solstices and equinoxes. In other words, the galactic and earth crosses coming together is an astronomical take on the underlying meaning of the solar octogram star. To top it all off, the Vatican obelisk is surmounted by a cross. The official story is that this massive pagan symbol was Christianized in this simplest of ways by putting a little cross on top. Hancock and Bival write in Talisman that an obelisk with a cross on top is actually the hieroglyph for Heliopolis, the city where this obelisk supposedly came from. On Christmas morning, this is the astronomical view from Vatican Square. Witcherink and Parlier have observed that the Silver Gate of Birth is due east of the obelisk in St. Peter's Square on the birthday of the Savior. I notice that the galactic midplane leads right down to the Roman pantheon. This is our cue to have a look at this ancient Roman marvel and explore its deeper meaning. Patrick Hunt, who teaches classical archaeology at Stanford University, calls the pantheon the most impressive Roman monumental building in the world. I see it as a calendar in stone. Its rotunda is an engineering marvel, employing techniques such as reinforced concrete, not rediscovered until almost 2,000 years later. In this plan view, you can see the floor pattern in which stone from all over the empire was inlaid, a testament to Rome's imperial might. Its circle and square motif might symbolize the Earth-Moon system in the following way. Here a circle is inscribed within a square. The square has 27.3% more area than the circle. Comparing a circle and square with equal perimeters, the circle's diameter is 27.3% larger than the edge of the square. Okay, so what? Well, the moon happens to be 27.3% the size of Earth, which is another way of relating moon to Earth with the proportion 3 to 11. In addition, the moon's sidereal orbital period is 27.3 days. The words moon, month, and menstruation all share the same root because they all have roughly the same period. 
Human gestation lasts on average 273 days. Another spooky coincidence has to do with temperature. As you're probably aware, Celsius is defined by a 100 degree scale, marking the freezing and boiling points of water. Water becomes liquid 273 degrees Celsius above absolute zero. Here are these numbers again. It seems to me that this fact references Earth as a water planet. Why are these numbers the same? Science has no answer for this other than pure coincidence. In this sectional view, you can see that a sphere fits perfectly within the volume the Pantheon encloses. I think recognizing this as the celestial sphere is the key to the Pantheon symbolism. The original Roman statuary fit into the seven alcoves. The Pantheon of pagan gods was replaced with Christian saints when the building was christened the Church of Santa Maria Rotunda in the year 609. Exchanging pagan gods for astrological symbols, we see an arrangement matching the Ptolemaic harmony of the spheres. To the modern eye, this sequence might seem arbitrary, but it actually ranks the planets in order of increasing apparent speed against the background of fixed stars as seen from Earth. Ptolemaic cosmology is therefore an Earth-centric approach to astronomy. Mark Booth writes in The Secret History of the World, Ptolemy's map of the spheres is conventionally presented as having been superseded by the ideas of Copernicus, Galileo, and so on, but in fact was and is an accurate map of the spiritual dimension of the cosmos, a dimension which seemed more real to the ancients than the material cosmos. Are you aware that the days of the week are named after the planets? With the exception of Saturn Day, Sun Day, and Moon Day, English speakers unfamiliar with Norse gods might have an easier time spotting this connection in French or Italian. Connecting the days of the week in order yields a seven-pointed star, somewhat distorted to accommodate squeezing it into the octagonal symmetry of the Pantheon. Looking up in the rotunda, you see the oculus, or central void in the dome. The oculus is the sole source of illumination in the interior so it clearly symbolizes the sun. The five rising tiers of coffers might represent the five planets visible with the naked eye from Earth. The 28 divisions around the circumference is where things really get interesting. It is my contention that the 28 rays represent days. Consider a month of four seven-day weeks lasting 28 days. 13 such months add up to 364 days. The extra day needed to round out a 365-day year is where we get the phrase, a year and a day. Richard Heath has traced this 13-month plus one-day calendar to the matriarchal societies of the Bronze Age. The Egyptian Sothic year lasted exactly 365 days, without compensating for leap year as we do today. Sothis is the Greek name for Sirius, the star the Egyptians based their new year on. Any way that Father Time slices it, the 28-day division fits the Osiris story. The Temple of Isis on the island of Philae has bas-reliefs which tell the Osiris story. Here Osiris has 28 stalks of wheat emerging from his dead body. The 13 pieces that Isis later reassembled symbolize the 13-month calendar of 28-day months and his missing phallus represents the extra day, rounding out the Sothic year. Many religious stories encrypt astronomical information in their core levels. Returning to Egypt for more wisdom, let's take a look at the Earth-Moon diagram that came from studying the Great Pyramid. Recall how the relative sizes of Moon and Earth fit the diagram when the circle was squared. John Michel rediscovered the key to much more ancient wisdom still encrypted in this diagram in his book, The Dimensions of Paradise. Michel expanded the number of spheres in the diagram from 1 to 12, for reasons that will soon become apparent. If the mean diameter of the moon is 2,160 miles, then the 12 moon evolution in the diagram encodes the great year. 2,160 times 12 equals 25,920, 
which is Earth's processional period. Each month in this so-called great year is likened to an age in astrology. We are currently leaving the age of Pisces, and it's the dawning of the age of Aquarius. John Michel calls this the New Jerusalem Diagram from his analysis of the revelation of St. John. A seven-pointed star resonates within. Remember the seven-rayed diadem of Isis and the seven rays of the Statue of Liberty? I prefer to call this the Isis Diagram in reference to the older stream of knowledge coming out of Egypt. The Isis Diagram encodes just intonation in music. On the most basic level, consider one octave of a piano keyboard. A total of twelve notes are divided by sharps, leaving seven white keys. The term sharp suggests the pointy heptagram, doesn't it? As we'll soon see at Chartres Cathedral, music, along with astronomy, geometry, and number theory, are all keys to this ancient mystery. Expanding the Isis diagram to contain four seven-pointed stars, we have what I call the Osiris diagram which encodes the Sothic year of 365 days in the following way. The 28 tips of the stars represent days in the ancient month. Twelve circles surround a thirteenth located at the center of the stars. The circles represent months. Thirteen months of 28 days each defines the year. The earth circle underlying the stars represents the extra day and completion of the Sothic year and the Sothic year was itself calibrated by the heliacal rising of the star of Isis, consort to Osiris. It's beautiful the way the geometry matches the cosmology. The architecture of the universe is embedded in Egyptian cosmology. To perceive the larger ramifications of the cosmology we are rediscovering, let's break away from 2D diagrams and explore where we live, the third dimension. It's a 3D reality that 12 spheres fit perfectly around a central 13th, with all of them tangent to each other, while the 13 fit perfectly within an overarching sphere. I think this 3D reality is the source of the obsession with the number 13 that we've seen symbolized in so many places. Recall all the lucky 13s on the Great Seal of the United States. Lucky 13 might be more precisely described as 12 surrounding 1. In The Last Supper, da Vinci depicts Jesus in the center, surrounded by 12 apostles. Geometrically speaking, connecting the centers of the 12 surrounding spheres with straight lines reveals what is called the cube octahedron. The cube octahedron has faces composed of squares and triangles ad quadratum et ad triangulum, as they would say in the Middle Ages. As it turns out, cube octahedral sphere packing has exactly seven planes of symmetry. Do these numbers sound familiar? Twelve around one with seven planes of symmetry? The cube octahedron is the 3D equivalent of the Isis diagram. The first ever known depiction of a cube octahedron was drawn by Leonardo da Vinci he created this illustration for Luca Pacioli's book, De Divina Proportione. Pacioli and da Vinci worked together, became close friends, and later shared a house together in Florence. Pacioli was at the center of the Renaissance Hermetic Obsession, begun by Cosimo de' Medici in 1430 when he obtained the Corpus Hermetica, a body of work compiled in the first few centuries of the Common Era, recounting words passed down by Thoth, through the last of the Egyptian priesthood in Alexandria. Here is Pacioli with a mysterious transparent cube octahedron half filled with water. Some believe the younger man standing next to him is Albrecht Dürer. In Divine Proportion, Priya Hemingway writes, In the autumn of 1506, Albrecht Dürer rode from Venice to Bologna to the home of Luca Pacioli, in order to be initiated in the mysteries of a secret perspective. Clearly the cube octahedron was important to these Renaissance masters immersed in hermetic knowledge. Perhaps they knew something we don't. In the 20th century, Buckminster Fuller was obsessed with the cube octahedron. He called it the Dymaxion and built his philosophy around it, 
because the cube octahedron is the only polyhedron completely in equilibrium. All 12 vectors emanating from its core have equal angles and all of its internal and external edges have equal length. In the 21st century, the cube octahedron is the foundation for physicist Nassim Haramein's unified field theory that offers a new solution to Einstein's field equations. Haramein claims that the vacuum, a term used by physicists to refer to a volume of space that is completely devoid of matter, actually has a structure, and this structure is based at the core on the cube octahedron. What we perceive as empty space is actually a seething cauldron of energy. Physicists calculate that the amount of energy in each and every cubic centimeter of space exceeds the energy output of all stars visible to the Hubble Space Telescope. The reason space seems empty is because all that energy is perfectly balanced in a state of equilibrium. It looks to us like nothing is there. Hermein has built his entire unified theory of physics on cube octahedral geometry. I believe Hermein is really onto something. His latest paper, the Schwarzschild proton, received the best paper award in a physics symposium in 2009. Modern physics seems to be catching up with ancient knowledge. To understand astronomy, one needs to have some background. Here's my crash course on esoteric astronomy in six quick lessons. The Earth revolves about the Sun in a plane called the ecliptic. The twelve constellations of fixed stars that intersect the ecliptic are called the zodiac. All the stars of the zodiac are actually our close neighbors compared to the size of our entire galaxy. The Earth's equator is tilted some 23 and a half degrees with respect to the ecliptic. Gary Osborne's fascinating Paradigm Shift website shows how the angle of the Earth's tilt is symbolized in art. Here are Isis and Osiris raising the Jed, which amazingly matches the angle of the Earth's tilt. And here again the 23 and a half degree angle matches the slope of the pyramid on the dollar bill. Osborne has found this same angle symbolized in many other pieces of esoteric art. The Earth's tilt is the reason we experience seasons. The seasons are defined by the Earth's orbit, which contains two solstices and two equinoxes. Looking at the solar system from above, the seasons naturally make a cross. Wichirink and Parlier call this the Earth Cross. Our galaxy is called the Milky Way because its myriad stars resemble milk streaking our night skies. If you were able to look at our galaxy edge on, you would see it as a flattened disk. This flattened structure is what makes the Milky Way look like a narrowly defined streak in the sky, rather than an even distribution of stars. The central plane of the galactic disk is called its midplane. The ecliptic is tilted some 120 degrees with respect to the midplane, naturally making a cross in two dimensions. Wichirink and Parlier call this the galactic cross. Imagine beginning a journey outside the galaxy, flying through the zodiac, passing by each one of the visible planets, and stopping on Earth for a while. After a short stay, you begin the journey home, traveling out past the planets, through the zodiac, and on toward the center of the galaxy. This route describes the mystical journey of the soul. It is mirrored in the Ptolemaic or geocentric cosmology that predated Copernicanism. The ancient Egyptians represented beginning and ending waypoints along the journey of the soul with silver and golden gates. Wichirink and Parlier show that the direction of the silver gate is located between the horns of Taurus as seen from Earth. You can find the horns by following Orion the Hunter's Club or Monoceros the Unicorn's Horn because both point at the intersection of the galactic midplane and the ecliptic, a point known to the Egyptians as the Silver Gate. Isis, shown with horns framing the sun disk, symbolizes her guardianship of the Silver Gate, or Gate of Birth. On the opposite side of the zodiac, the Golden Gate is located close to where the arrow of Sagittarius is pointing, 
and where the stinger of Scorpio is reaching. The Golden Gate is the second place where the galactic midplane and ecliptic intersect. The winged scarab framing a sun disk was used to symbolize guardianship over the Golden Gate, or Gate of Death. The scarab is an appropriate symbol because of how this insect pushes dung balls backward with its hind legs, mimicking the sun's retrograde processional motion through the zodiac. The coat of arms for the state of Vatican City features silver and gold keys because these are the keys to the kingdom that Christ gave to Peter. Pietro Perugino's fresco in the Sistine Chapel shows Christ giving one silver and one gold key to Peter. I see the two Roman arches flanking the fresco as secretly depicting the Egyptian silver and golden gates. The octagonal domed building in the center clearly represents the sun, and the perspective grid must be the ecliptic. The people in the piazza are taking the journey of the soul. I was taught as a child to follow the outer edge of the Big Dipper to find the North Star Polaris. In the past this rule of thumb didn't always work, because the celestial pole changes over time due to the Earth's precession. When the Great Pyramid was built, the star Thuban in the constellation Draco was the North Star. Remember, one of the pyramid shafts point at Thuban. The celestial pole actually traces out a circle in the heavens, representing the 25,920-year processional cycle. This cycle is called the Great Year. In 3D, the Great Year is seen as a processional cone swept out over time by the Earth's tilted axis. The Earth's processional cone, the Sun, and the galactic midplane will precisely align on winter solstice 2012. Author John Major Jenkins calls this phenomenon galactic alignment. The Mayan Long Count Calendar was designed to end on winter solstice, December 21, 2012. Acharya S. says in The Christ Conspiracy, Many of the world's crucified godmen had their traditional birthdays on December 25th. This date is set because the ancients recognized that the sun makes an annual descent southward until after midnight of December 21st, the winter solstice, when it stops moving southerly for three days and was born again after midnight of December 24th. Thus, these many different cultures celebrated with great joy the Son of God's birthday on December 25th. Christmas 2012 marks the beginning of a new great year. The Milky Way galaxy has a rotational period that I like to call the galactic year. It lasts approximately 224 million years. Our solar system is related to the larger cycle through number. There are 8,640 great years in the galactic year. It's amazing how the Earth's processional cycle, the number of the Sun, and the decad harmonize with the galactic year. Astronomy grew out of the much older tradition of astrology, the belief that the movement of planets influences events experienced on the human scale. Astrology is the quintessential hermetic art epitomized in the motto, As above, so below. You might not be aware how interconnected astrology is with Ptolemaic cosmology, the tarot, and magic squares. Let's have a closer look. Viewed from above, the galactic cross looks like this. The red arrow indicates the direction of soul travel through the system. The galactic midplane is represented by the signs Taurus and Scorpio, and the ecliptic by Aquarius and Leo. These four together are known in astrology as the fixed signs. In the tarot, these signs adorn the corners of the world card. The eagle is the ancient version of Scorpio, and man is of course the water bearer. I see the Ouroboros as the orbit of the planets, and the wands Isis is holding symbolizing the columns of the silver gate. The high priestess card links the tarot with ancient Egypt, Freemasonry, and the Kabbalah. Notice how the columns have capitals just like those in the hypostyle hall of the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. 
The priestess sits between the Masonic columns Boaz and Jachin. The fruits behind her are arranged in the Kircher Tree of Life pattern. In the Kabbalah, each Sephiro in the Tree of Life is associated with a particular planet. Rick Campbell of DCSymbols.com identified a lightning path passing through the Tree of Life that amazingly follows the Ptolemaic order of the spheres. This is the missing link between the Tree of Life and the mystical journey of the soul. In the Bible, Ezekiel had a mystical vision where he saw living creatures run and return as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Might Ezekiel's lightning vision be recapitulating the mystical journey of the soul? The 22 major arcana cards in the tarot map to the 22 paths connecting the sephiro in the Tree of Life. The suits, ranging from aces through tens, map to the sephiro themselves. The tarot is therefore highly correlated with the Kabbalah. A magic square is an arrangement of numbers in a square grid such that the numbers in all columns, rows, and diagonals sum to the same constant. In this case, it's 15. Here is the first magic square ever to be seen in European art. All rows, columns, and diagonals in this square sum to 34. Incidentally, the artist strategically placed these two numbers together to read 1514, the year the engraving was made. Yes, this magic square is part of Albrecht Dürer's Melancholia I that we've seen several times before. Luca Pacioli also studied magic squares and collected a large number of examples. I suspect Pacioli educated Dürer in the use of magic squares, as I already established their relationship in the Rome episode. A contemporary of Pacioli and Dürer, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, wrote De Occulta Philosophia, which drew on all the important hermetic books brought to light by Cosimo de' Medici that you learned about in the San Francisco episode. Agrippa explained that there really is magic within magic squares. Sigils can be encrypted within magic squares to call upon angels and demons. Agrippa associated magic squares of order 3 to 9 with specific planets. Why the sun was associated with the 6 by 6 magic square is simple. The sun is the sixth planet in Ptolemaic order. An interesting fact about the magic square of the sun is that the sum of all of its columns or rows is 666, the loaded number we saw in the detour to Winnipeg within the Jerusalem episode. We'll decode the so-called number of the beast in Paris, part one. Before the Italian Renaissance, there was an earlier flowering of ancient knowledge in medieval France. This was initiated when nine self-described poor knights of Christ returned from a decade of excavation work undertaken in the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. The most famous preacher of the age, St. Bernard de Clairvaux, argued persuasively on their behalf at the Council of Troyes in 1129. This resulted in the Templar Order being officially chartered and endorsed by the Catholic Church. The poor Templars instantly became a favored charity, and it certainly didn't hurt when the Pope signed an order saying they didn't have to pay any taxes, could pass freely through international borders, and were exempt from all legal authorities save for his own. This also tells you something about just how powerful the papacy was in those days. The Templars accepted large donations and monetary deposits, started issuing letters of credit, opened banks in several countries, and essentially became the first multinational corporation. Very quickly the Templars had an abundance of gold and military power. To me the question is, what did those nine poor knights find in Jerusalem that led to their meteoric rise in power? Could they have found Enoch's cube buried in the Temple Mount from before the Great Flood? Whatever the case, I believe they unearthed knowledge rather than gold. And with knowledge comes power. Speaking of someone with sacred knowledge, St. Bernard de Clairvaux is a fascinating figure. Norman Cantor had this to say about Bernard in his book The Civilization of the Middle Ages. Bernard played the leading role in the development of the virgin cult, which is one of the most important manifestations of the popular piety of the 12th century. 
In early medieval thought, the Virgin Mary had played a minor role, and it was only with the rise of emotional Christianity in the 11th century that she became the prime intercessor for humanity with the deity. Bernard wrote, No one can enter heaven unless by Mary, as though through a door. In this illumination, Bernard is shown receiving a stream of milk from the Virgin's breast. He wrote several works on the Queen of Heaven, which was also an epithet used in ancient Egypt for Isis. Essentially, Bernard reintroduced the cult of Isis to the West under the veil of Mary. As the primary architect of the Cistercian and Templar orders, Bernard's writings had a major impact on the Gothic building explosion that ensued all over Europe for the next 300 years. On building, Bernard wrote, There must be no decoration, only proportion. As you've seen, proportion is what sacred geometry is all about. Although the current Cathedral of Our Lady of Chartres was begun a few decades after St. Bernard's death, Chartres had long before been a pilgrimage center dedicated to the Virgin. Since 876, the site housed the Sancta Camisa, a tunic said to have been worn by the Virgin Mary. When the old church at Chartres burned down, the relic was feared lost. When the Sancta Camisa was discovered unharmed in the ashes, it was deemed a miracle. The dramatic recovery of the relic catalyzed medieval Europe's interest in the building project, and Chartres ended up becoming the first cathedral dedicated to Notre Dame, and one of the finest examples of Gothic architecture in the world. More than a place of religious worship, Chartres was also a cathedral school in the medieval period. In this school, Platonic and Pythagorean thought passed through a Christian filter and resurfaced in the West after a thousand-year hiatus. Chartres remembers Pythagoras in this sculpture in the right bay of the royal portal Tympanum. The seven liberal arts comprised the curriculum taught in the school of Chartres. The seven arts were split into two groups, the trivium and quadrivium. Trivium is where we get the word trivial, because grammar, rhetoric, and logic were considered basic but necessary skills to master before studying the more challenging quadrivium subjects which included number theory, music, geometry, and astronomy. Each one of the subjects in the quadrivium serves as a key to the ancient mysteries. The seven medieval liberal arts were a bit different compared to a liberal arts degree today. These subjects were taught only to the elite. The so-called servile arts were taught to tradespeople employed by the elite. The goal of the servile arts was not to cultivate critical thinking, but to develop specific skills required by farmers, blacksmiths, carpenters, stonemasons, and so on. This liberal, servile division mirrors the internal division between speculative masons, more commonly known as Freemasons, and the operative stonemasons who actually built the cathedral. Australian architect John James has discovered how the floor plan of the cathedral was laid out ad quadratum as you can see from the red squares. The smaller squares are half the size of the larger, as octaves are related in music. The template for the cathedral ground plan clearly echoes the quadrivium. Two millennia ago, famed Roman architect Vitruvius described in his Ten Books of Architecture that effective temples are based on the proportions of the human body. Vitruvius's written description of ideal human proportions later influenced many Renaissance artists, including Leonardo da Vinci and Cesare Cesariano. Here, Cesariano's Vitruvian Man fits the cathedral's ground plan and shows that it was based on the proportions of the human body as laid out in antiquity. English professor of architecture Keith Critchlow has discovered a fascinating correlation between the floor plan and front elevation of Chartres. Intrigued by the fact that the rose windows containing the exquisite stained glass and the themed labyrinth have equal diameters, Critchlow compared the plan to the elevation. The rose window and the labyrinth line up perfectly, like so. The golden ball atop the sun tower aligns with the curve of the apse here. The moon tower's silver ball corresponds to the rond point, the center from which the chapels radiate. 
Clearly the design is correlated in two separate dimensions. Boaz and Jachin are the names of the two columns that stood at the entry to Solomon's temple that are echoed in all Masonic temples today. Boaz stood on the left, and the name Boaz means sun. Jachin stood on the right and means moon. This symbolism matches the towers at Chart. Critchlow explains that the sun tower is 365 English feet in height. The moon tower is slightly shorter, some 28 feet less. These measurements suggest several things. Number one, the design was based on the English foot. Number two, the 365-foot sun tower symbolizes the year. And number three, the 28-foot difference in the moon tower symbolizes the 28-day month of four seven-day weeks. I think this metrology shows how Chart is a calendar in stone, very much like the Roman pantheon. Before the Christian era, the grotto below Chart was a druidic shrine of Isis. Above the crypt today there is a black Madonna and child called Our Lady of the Pillar that many suspect has a meaning older than Christianity. The Druid grotto housed a sacred dolmen that was identified with the womb of the earth. Think about it. Both Isis and Mary were called Queen of Heaven, identified as so-called virgins who had unusual conceptions, and later had sons who symbolized the sun, who also shared the same birthday. The story of Mary and Jesus is a recapitulation of the ancient Egyptian story of Isis and Horus. The Black Madonna hints at her African origins while retaining just enough plausible deniability to avert uncomfortable questions for the Church. Shark Cathedral's axis is oriented to the summer solstice sunrise, just like the red alignment Sixtus V set up in Vatican Square. The labyrinth is not a maze, because there is only one path to follow, like the life we live from birth to death. The labyrinth's eleven concentric rings match the Ptolemaic cosmology, or spiritual dimension of the cosmos. Walking the labyrinth is therefore like taking the journey of the soul. There are 112 cogs on the outside of the labyrinth, a fact which has puzzled scholars. In them, John James has discovered an unexpected connection to the Arab world. John James writes, The 8th century Arab Sufi alchemist Jabir ibn Hayyan divided the four elementary qualities of existence, earth, air, fire, and water, into four degrees with seven subdivisions, giving a total of 112 classifications, which between them contained all the materials, liquids, and gases found in manifest creation. Known in the West as Geber, and considered to be the father of chemistry, he worked in the court of Caliph Harun al-Rashid, for whom he wrote the Book of Venus on the Art of Alchemy. His work paved the way for later Islamic and European alchemists in their search for the Philosopher's Stone. Among his long list of achievements, Geber pioneered techniques in glassmaking that were used in the stained glass directly above the labyrinth that bears his philosophical number symbolism. Modern chemists still don't understand what gives the Chart glass such incredible vibrancy. Sir Lawrence Gardner says in The Bloodline of the Holy Grail, One of the greatest mysteries of Gothic architecture is the stained glass used in the cathedral windows. The first appeared in the early 12th century but disappeared just as suddenly a hundred years later. Nothing like it has been seen before, and nothing like it has been seen since. Not only is the luminosity of Gothic glass greater than any other, but its light enhancement qualities are far more effective. Unlike the stained glass of other architectural schools, its interior effect is the same, whether the light outside is bright or dim. Even in twilight, this glass retains brilliance way beyond that of any other. Richlow says in the Shark Cathedral, A Sacred Geometry, DVD, that he was approached by a Hindu gentleman who explained the meaning of the number symbolism on the western facade. In Hinduism, chakras are traditionally symbolized by lotus flowers with specific numbers of petals. Amazingly, specific details on the facade match this symbolism. The facade is a reminder that the cathedral houses the body of the church, or more importantly, perhaps, Chart is saying the body is a temple.
Chart is a masterwork of hidden syncretism, melding belief systems that secretly transcend Christian dogma. The tympanum above the central front doors of the royal portal encodes an entire cosmology. The four figures surrounding Christ depict a man, eagle, lion, and bull. In Christianity, these are the four beasts of the Apocalypse as described in the mystical visions of Ezekiel and St. John of Patmos. On the literal level, it's Jesus with a halo waving at us from inside of Vesica Pisces, surrounded by the four beasts of the Apocalypse. A strange collection of Christian imagery, perhaps, but not uncommon. In time, the four beasts became synonymous with the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, when you understand the symbolism, a reading of the encoded message becomes possible. As you learned in my crash course in esoteric astronomy, these beasts are the fixed astrological signs symbolizing the galactic cross. Jan Witcherink says Christ's halo represents the earth cross. I see the sun god welcoming you through the galactic stargate at the moment of your apotheosis, a royal portal indeed. I have uncovered sacred design templates underlying the principal section drawing cut through Chart Cathedral. Stephen Skinner identified circles guiding the central vault and flying buttress designs in his book Sacred Geometry. His observations allowed me to take the geometric analysis a few steps further. I see two sets of three stacked rhombi guiding the wall design. Circles drawn from the tips of paired equilateral triangles define the centers of the buttresses in trados, or lower curves, and mark the spring line of the lower arch. This revolutionary design allowed the masonry to be lighter and the windows larger, admitting the flood of light characteristic of the Gothic style. Now you can appreciate how the walls at Chart were designed ad triangulum. What is more, the diameter of these circles equals the size of the rose windows and the labyrinth. It's almost as if the designer never changed the distance set between his compasses when designing the entire structure. Critchlow points out that the names of the architects of Chart were never recorded. They were known only as the masters of the compasses. In researching the House of the Temple in D.C., I came across a rare depiction of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life in Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, shown here as a set of three stacked rhombi. This knowledge encoded at Chart was preserved by Freemasons. For the next revelation, we turn to music and geometry. In music, an octave is the interval between one note and another having double its frequency. In plane geometry, you can symbolize the octave in two ways, ad triangulum or ad quadratum. The circle outside the triangle has double the diameter of the circle inside circle outside the square has double the area of the circle inside. The central vault is defined by a larger circle having twice the diameter of the smaller circle inside, which itself is equal to the diameter of all the circles in the wall section, the rose windows, and the labyrinth. Chart is therefore based on one circle repeated using musical principles. Amazingly, the flower of life fits this geometry. Perhaps the master of the compasses used the flower as the overarching design template. You can draw the flower of life using compasses only. The nave width is set by a central circle which is tangent to four others, having equal diameters. The central circle shown within the yellow triangle completes the picture. Masonic society probably began around the time Chart was being built. Recall how St. Bernard de Clairvaux was instrumental in the formation of the Templars, and later, after the Templars were taken down, the knowledge they unearthed from Solomon's Temple went back underground to survive in Masonry, Rosicrucianism, and other secret societies. The Masonic square and compasses emblem often depicts these instruments surrounding the letter G. As with most symbols, the meaning of G depends upon your level of knowledge. I've seen it referred to at times as geometry, the generative principle, and most appropriately for what I'm investigating, the great architect of the universe. 
I discovered a long-distance alignment that leads from France to the United Kingdom. This one begins very close to Chartres, both in time and space. Chartres Cathedral was built at the same time as Bourges Cathedral, and is only a hundred miles away. When I was studying Bourges Cathedral, I kept thinking about the connections between the founder of the Gothic style and the Templars. So I drew a line in Google Earth from the central entry of Bourges Cathedral to the entry of Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland. So what? You can draw a line between any two points, but you won't believe what the line passes directly over in London, the headquarters of the United Grand Freemasonic Lodge of England. The United Grand Lodge of England is the main governing body of Freemasonry within England, Wales, and much of the former British Empire. The building is on Great Queen Street, no less. Ugly, as the organization is known, seems to be a fitting acronym for its Ugly as Sin container, historically third on the site since Masonic meetings first started here in 1775, a year before the American Revolution. Perhaps some of America's Masonic founding fathers planned the revolution here. I'm not sure. When the Templars were around, they controlled a sizable district less than half a mile away in the city of London. The temple includes Temple Church, the adjacent middle and outer temples, and a host of related buildings. The Templars themselves said they designed the round portion of Temple Church after the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem which also features a rotunda. Perhaps politics motivated them to claim Christian provenance for their temple. Longtime esoteric researcher John Smout says a better geometric comparison is between Temple Church and the Dome of the Rock, which seems to have a high degree of correlation with the round church's ground plan. This makes more sense to me as the Templars did take their name from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Case in point, they were never known as the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. Whichever building was ultimately their template, the Templar influence was so powerful that they actually got the Patriarch of Jerusalem to come to London and consecrate Temple Church in 1185. Temple Church was brought to the public's attention in the Da Vinci Code, where it was the scene of a shootout amidst marble effigies of medieval knights. The temple served at times as the residence of kings and representatives of the Pope, while Temple Church itself served as a depository bank. I believe Smout's geometric analysis of Temple Church is right on the money, if you'll pardon the pun. The temple plan is laid out with triangles and squares, which we know from studying Chart Cathedral have hidden significance. Triangles and squares are arranged in such a way as to depict three cubes. The symbolism of three cubes is something we've seen before in the George Washington Masonic National Memorial. I believe three cubes symbolize the holographic nature of the universe, the human, planetary, and stellar scales resonating as a fractal structure, as above, so below. My reasons for coming to this unusual conclusion will become apparent in the Paris episodes. After the Great Fire of London in 1666, Sir Christopher Wren was chosen to redesign St. Paul's Cathedral. He oriented St. Paul's in line with the axis of Temple Church. Extending beyond St. Paul's, we see the alignment continues to the Bank of England. The bank was chartered in 1694 during the construction of Wren's Cathedral. More than just a local branch, the Bank of England is the central bank of the whole of the United Kingdom and is the model on which most countries' modern central banks are based. The Bank of England is literally the mother of all banks. Recall how the Templars' meteoric rise in power came in part by becoming the first transnational bank, and how Temple Church itself acted as a bank, whilst housing both royals and papal representatives. By tracing the alignment from Temple Church to the Bank of England through St. Paul's Cathedral, we draw a connection between Templars, the modern banking system, and the Church, three powerful bedfellows. The Bank of England presides over a street pyramid in the heart of the City of London. The symbolism of the bank over a pyramid suggests a hidden power relationship, 
analogous to the House of the Temple presiding over the Pyramid of Washington, D.C. After all, pyramids are clear symbols of hierarchy, and one can read it as control from the top down. The base of the pyramid contains the London Stone, said to be the rock from which all distances in the United Kingdom were measured. The Romans laid this foundation stone in London, just as they had done earlier with the umbilicus urbis Romae. You could say this pyramid was built on a rock-solid Roman foundation. Some of the greatest secrets are hidden in plain sight. Isn't that strange? I mean, if you ran a secret society, why painstakingly encrypt your greatest truths in alignments, city plans, and in architecture? I would have thought there were better ways of keeping secrets. There must be some kind of power gained or maintained by hiding these truths out in the open where many can see, but few understand. Sir Christopher Wren was a brilliant mathematician, astronomer, geometer, and architect. He was an enlightened man who clearly excelled in the seven liberal arts. St. Paul's Cathedral is the most important building of Wren's architectural career. Stephen Skinner pointed out in his book Sacred Geometry that the length of St. Paul's, including its entrance steps, measures 555 feet, and that this distance is equal to the height of the Washington Monument. Recall how triple sixes and fives are encoded in this singular measure, as 6,660 inches equals 555 feet. St. Paul's length therefore symbolizes the relationship between macrocosm and microcosm. The distance from the floor of the cathedral to the top of the cross on its dome is 365 feet, matching the height and symbolism of the sun tower at Chartres. St. Paul's is one of the few places we're not surprised to see the English foot used as the unit of measure. Trying to decipher London from another angle, I was looking at Buckingham Palace and wondering about the perfectly straight axis called the Mall in front of it. Wanting to trace where this obvious gesture leads, I need to ask where does the royal axis go? It appears that the mall leads to the Admiralty Arch, but then the axis seems to fade away in the confusion of buildings along the Strand. Or does it? Tracing the axis beginning at Buckingham Palace, passing over the Victoria Memorial, traveling along the mall, going under the Admiralty Arch and through the buildings on the Strand, the axis arrives precisely at Temple Bar. Temple Bar was a gate designed by Sir Christopher Wren to ceremonially bar access to the City of London. It got the name Temple from being directly in front of the Templar compound. The temple was taken over by the Inns of Court after the Templars were ousted in 1307. The Middle Temple and Outer Temple are two of the Inns of Court to which all barristers in England must today belong. In fact, the phrase the bar, meaning the legal profession as a whole, can be traced back to Temple Bar. Wren's Gate is no longer there, but tradition and the law remain. Traditionally, the Lord Mayor would offer the sword of state to the Queen when she passed through the gate as a token of loyalty. It is a little-known legal fact that the monarch may not enter the City of London without the permission of the Lord Mayor of London. What's up with that? I always thought the Queen was the one in charge. You might be surprised to learn that the Lord Mayor is not the Mayor of London, nor is the City of London the same as Greater London. Confused? The law can do that. The person the Queen bows to is the Lord Mayor of London. He's the guy who runs the City of London Corporation, a tiny private jurisdiction that covers only about one square mile. The wealthiest square mile on earth, as it's often referred to, is the sovereign state within Greater London, whose boundary closely follows the ancient Roman walls of Londinium. In Isaac Newton's day, there were more than 200,000 souls living within the square mile, but now that figure is down to less than 10,000. Today the tiny city of London has become a leading center of global finance. Other powerful sovereign cities within cities that come to mind are of course the United Nations headquarters and Vatican City. Let's see if you can guess the final city in my world tour. 
Here we are over a semi-public urban park. I was drawn to this place when I read it had a small Egyptian pyramid folly, nine gates, and a fifth-generation watchman who lives in the diminutive rotunda building right here. Five generations of watchmen living in a tiny pavilion must be motivated to guard something pretty interesting. The informal layout and curving walkways say English Garden, but having been immersed in London, something bigger popped out at me. The shape of the park. It closely matches the ancient walls of the City of London. This park was built by the richest man in the country, who was also a king's cousin. He was a lover of all things English, an enemy of all things royalist. He ended up being beheaded like so many others of his time. Where are we? If you guessed Paris, you're correct. We entered the City of Light through the portal of Parc Monceau, established by Louis-Philippe II, Duc d'Orléans. As you may have guessed, the Duke of Orleans was a Freemason. He actually served as Grand Master of the governing body of French Freemasonry, the Grand Orient of France. The pyramid in Parc Monceau is trivial, however, compared to what the Louvre pyramid encodes. President Francois Mitterrand commissioned the Louvre pyramid and the adjacent Pyramid in Versailles to be completed by 1989 for the celebration of the bicentennial of the French Revolution. Mitterrand personally selected architect I.M. Pei without hosting a design competition, as would be expected for such an important commission. The modern pyramid's metal armature was designed to support a lot of glass. Wikipedia states that the official brochure published during construction cited 666 as its number of panes, but then writes it off as an urban legend because, in actual fact, the pyramid contains a different number of panes. That didn't stop various journalists at the time from drumming up quite a controversy about the number of the beast, and Mitterrand was jokingly referred to as the Sun King for a while. However, I have indeed found 666 rhombi symbolized in the pyramid. Why rhombi, you ask? A rhombus can be made from two conjoined equilateral triangles. The rhombus is the masculine or linear element inside the feminine curves of the vesica Pisces whose name means Vessel of the Fish, because the Christian fish symbol emerges from it. The rhombus is therefore a sacred symbol. Notice how each of the larger rhombic frames contains 36 rhombic panes of glass. As you can see, the number of rhombic panes on a typical face adds up to 153. This is a very interesting number that has mystical Christian significance. Do you remember the square root of 153 being equal to the number of moons in a year? We learned that fact by studying Stonehenge. Here's a quote from the New Testament that entangles fish and 153 in a Christian net. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. This number of fish, I mean, why bother enumerating them, has puzzled scholars for centuries, and is an example of how parables in the Bible encrypt important information in plain text. Here's Jesus describing his practice of hiding information in symbols. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not neither do they understand. Tabulating the additional triangles and converting them to rhombi, and then adding the number of rhombic frames, we get 166.5 symbolic rhombi in a typical face, and four such faces equals 666. Let's look at the actual Bible quote and see what it tells us in regard to the infamous number of the beast. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. Why man is called a beast should be obvious by what humans are doing to this planet's natural environment. We may be bestial in our unenlightened state, but this is beside the point I'm making. The beast here is not Satan, but man. In particular, the Louvre Pyramid is about a man. 
Robert Bavall had a stunning realization described in the book Talisman. He realized the historic core of Paris is correlated with the temples of Luxor and Karnak in Egypt. Luxor and Karnak are adjacent ancient temples. Bavall observed that the six-degree angle between the axes of Luxor and Karnak match the six-degree bend in the Louvre. The Temple of Luxor is the one with the embedded six-degree angle. I went a step further and laid the Luxor ground plan over the Louvre and the Tuileries garden. The Tuileries was laid out by Le Notre at the request of Louis XIV. We see this direct correlation only when the temple plan is mirrored. Might the Sun King's intention have been for Paris to be the mirror of Luxor? Validation that the Temple of Luxor was used as a design template is the fact that the obelisk erected in the Place de la Concorde is from the very same Temple of Luxor. After the Revolution, the Luxor obelisk replaced the guillotine in what became known as the Place de la Concorde. In an outstanding act of engineering, the obelisk was erected by the aforementioned Duke of Orleans' son, who many years after the 1789 Revolution, became the last king of France. The important thing to recognize here is that the French obsession with hermetic symbolism passed through the revolution completely unscathed. In the early 20th century, modern French alchemist Schwaller de Lubix lived in Luxor for 15 years. Out of his intensive study came the book The Temple of Man, wherein he showed how the Temple of Luxor represents the body of a man. Now we're really on to something. I see the head here, the neck, the heart, all the way to the small chambers of the intestines here. The obelisk is, of course, his erect phallus. The ancient Egyptians related the cult of the phallus with the dismemberment of Osiris. Next I overlaid the most famous depiction of the human body ever made, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. See how his leg follows the bend in the seine? These roads follow the angle of his other leg, and the Luxembourg garden seem to parallel his arm. Could the Vitruvian man be another hidden template in the design of Paris? If so, I suspect the man of Paris is Osiris. Thinking on this, I started to see energy centers in the parterres of the Tuileries. At first I thought they were chakras, but their locations tell a slightly different story. In a normal state of consciousness, people don't see chakras. However, as we learned at Chartres, chakras are part of the architecture of the universe we've been investigating. If chakras exist on another level of reality, call it the etheric body or aura if you will, then their interface in our everyday reality is controlled by the endocrine system in the physical body. Why do we care? Because stimulating and balancing the endocrine system can lead to states of ecstasy, using more of the brain, slowing the aging process, attaining enlightenment, and even experiencing everlasting life, as some believe. I was able to pinpoint gland locations in Paris because of another observation. Many famous public spaces have axial streets pointing directly to where the ductless glands would be in the body of a man. The Church of the Madeleine and Palais Bourbon form a cross axis directly in line with the obelisk in La Place de la Concorde. On one side we have Napoleon's church venerating Mary Magdalene who is said to have started the royal bloodline of the Son of God. On the other side is the Palais Bourbon containing the lower house of the Parliament of France, known as the National Assembly. These two Roman-styled temples energize the gonads in the body of Paris on either side of his phallus centered on the axe historique. The gland most associated with enlightened states is of course the pineal, which actually looks like a tiny pine cone in the center of the human brain. This colossal pine cone is in the courtyard of the Belvedere in the Vatican, a name which recalls the affluent town of the same name overlooking San Francisco. The pine cone is flanked by two peacocks, which are ancient symbols of resurrection that predate Christianity. Believe it or not, there is an empty black coffin I couldn't get a picture of behind the colossal pine cone that symbolizes the death and rebirth of Osiris. 
The pine cone in the private courtyard is actually a first century bronze that used to act as a fountain in front of the Temple of Isis in ancient Rome. In the Renaissance, Sixtus V built the library wing that closed off the courtyard, perhaps in order to hide pagan symbols not easily explained by the Catholic Church. The pineal gland of Paris marks one endpoint of a line starting at the Paris Observatory, whose construction was incidentally authorized by Louis XIV. This axis passes directly through the French Senate and the Luxembourg Gardens. This cosmic connection to enlightenment is not lost on me. Also notable is the fact that nothing aligns with the thymus or throat chakra. As the throat is associated with speaking and communication, it seems appropriate nothing should energize this center if secrecy is to be maintained. Each of the other alignments is an interesting case study for further analysis. Parc Monceau is right under the Vitruvian man's foot. His outstretched leg seems to point directly at the rotunda building where the gatekeeper lives. The tiny rotunda was designed by architect Claude Nicolas Ledoux, an interesting figure to be sure. Ledoux built 63 toll barrier buildings in the city wall built around Paris in the Ancien Regime to collect taxes. This tax wall was universally hated and was torn down during the revolution. When the Paris Metro was built, it made sense to dig up the city where the extra space for the wall had been, so Metro Lines 2 and 6 follow the tax wall boundary. Only three of Ledoux's tax structures remain today, and the rotunda in Parc Monceau is one of them. I submit that it's no accident that precisely these Ledoux buildings were left intact. We already know about the rotunda, but what is the significance of these other two Ledoux buildings? They're all about solar alignment. The red line pointing to the Rotunda de la Villette in Place Stalingrad precisely marks the azimuth of summer solstice sunrise. Look at how this water channel continues the alignment. Some other examples of this alignment we've seen before are the line connecting the Vatican obelisk with the obelisk in Piazza del Popolo and in the orientation of Chartres Cathedral. The green line pointing to the Barrier de Enfer, or Gate of Hell, is oriented appropriately due south. It's called the Gate of Hell because Ledoux's pair of tax collection buildings are immediately adjacent to the entrance of the Paris catacombs. This reminds me of the phrase, nothing is as sure as death and taxes. The yellow line points to the Trocadero in the azimuth of equinoctial sunset. Trocadero marks the beginning of the white axis running through the Eiffel Tower and the École Militaire complex. The white line connects Trocadero to the Gate of Hell, but has no astronomical meaning as far as I can tell. The blue line starts at the obelisk at Place Fontenoy, which is right on the white axis in front of UNESCO. This non-Egyptian obelisk commemorates a battle that took place in the year 841 but the obelisk was erected here in 1860. The blue line is precisely the azimuth of winter solstice sunset. Maybe you're wondering where all the colored lines converge. Their common center is precisely at the entrance to the Tuileries garden. But why is it there? Before the revolution, the Tuileries was a royal palace that closed off the Louvre courtyard. The center point of the solar alignments lies directly in front of the entrance to the royal palace. The palace was destroyed in the chaos of the revolution, but the alignments remain. Just like the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Louvre Pyramid will yield more secrets upon further analysis. The plan of the Louvre Pyramid and the fountains surrounding it is itself a sacred diagram. Referred to as the sacred cut of Ad Quadratum, the diagram was traditionally used as an astrological house chart in centuries past. Overlaid is the house chart Johannes Kepler made for General Wallenstein in 1608. Yes, that's the same Kepler who discovered the three laws of planetary motion that keep telecommunication satellites in orbit today. Astrology is actually very serious business. The Louvre Pyramid acts as entrance to the world's most visited museum. Recall how I overlaid the Vitruvian Man only after analyzing the pyramid itself and finding the mark of the beast encoded within. 
The Vitruvian man's mouth corresponds appropriately with this entrance, so the next time you enter the Louvre, ponder its symbolism. You are entering the mouth of the beast. Look at what is aligned with this so-called mouth, the Palais Royal. Central to French history, the Palais Royal is where many generations of royals lived. Louis the Fourteenth grew up there, for example. The Duke of Orleans later owned the palace. I was extremely surprised to recognize the 5 by 12 Jerusalem rectangle precisely framed in the proportions of the royal palace's court of honor. The palace garden's two famous lawns symbolize the two holiest spots in Christianity and Judaism. There is clearly a royal French connection to the ancient mysteries. Royal of Royals, Louis XIV's reign of 72 years was longer and arguably more powerful than any other king in European history. Architect of the Vatican St. Peter's Square, Gian Lorenzo Bernini allegorically portrayed Louis XIV as Alexander the Great in the famous equestrian statue located in front of the Louvre Pyramid. This statue marks the beginning and faces in the direction of what is called the Axe Historique of Paris. The historical axis runs from the equestrian statue of Louis XIV, under Napoleon's Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, through the Tuileries, over the Luxor Obelisk, under the Arc de Triomphe, all the way along the Champs Elysees to its endpoint within the Grand Arch in La Défense. French Egyptologist Jean-Marcel Humbert had this to say about the Axe Historique. I have not verified this, but it is said that the Great Axis is a Masonic alignment, and that this is not the result of chance. It is known that the Freemasons find their origins in ancient Egypt. I have verified that the Axe Historique is indeed aligned to the heliacal rising of Sirius, just as is the older Notre Dame on the Ile de la Cité whose axis parallels the Champs-Élysées. Hancock and Beval trace the origins of this alignment to the fact that Notre Dame was likely built over an ancient Roman temple of Isis. Notre Dame, or Our Lady, is therefore Mary veiling Isis. Perhaps even more amazing, Hancock and Beval show the word Paris comes from the melding together of the words Faria Isis, Faria, or Pharos in Greek, is the island where the wondrous lighthouse of Alexandria was, and the center of Isis worship in antiquity. Now let's imagine taking an enlightening ride with the Sun King along the axis he laid out, which was greatly embellished with hidden symbolism by Napoleon, Mitterrand, and many others on up to the present day. For the first destination, we must travel underground, both under the Earth's surface and below public consciousness. La Pyramide in Versailles is an underground atrium space surrounded by fashionable boutiques. The downward-facing pyramid is the symbolic opposite to the famous museum entrance. As the upward-pointing pyramid symbolizes a man, the inverted pyramid must therefore represent a woman. In alchemy, the symbols for fire and water are upward and downward-facing triangles. This polarity is also represented in Western mysticism as sword and chalice. The chalice in question is, of course, the Holy Grail. Going with the Holy Blood, Holy Grail thesis, it's fitting that Dan Brown chose to portray the location of the tomb of Mary Magdalene right here, under the pyramid in Versailles, at the end of the Da Vinci Code. If the Star of David is the symbol of the union of male and female, then the star tetrahedron is its 3D equivalent. Drunvalo Melchizedek's volumes on the ancient secret of the flower of life show the human energy field, or Merkaba as it's known, takes the form of a star tetrahedron, male and female being inversions of each other. On a higher level, Richard Hoagland has shown how star tetrahedron geometry is implicated in hyperdimensional energy outflows coming from planetary cores in our solar system. When a star tetrahedron is inscribed within a sphere, its points touch the sphere's surface at 19.5 degrees north and south latitude. On Earth, one of the tetrahedral points is on the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii, 
which is actually the largest mountain on Earth if measured from the seafloor. Similar energy outflows occur at 19.5 degrees north or south on Mars Olympus Mons, which is the largest mountain in the solar system, in Jupiter's Great Red Spot, and Neptune's Great Dark Spot. Explaining these outflows requires a four-dimensional model of physics, where energy is gated from the Sun to the planetary cores through hyperspace. Energy transduced by each planetary body appears to us as heat in 3D, emerging from the most stable of all three-dimensional forms, the star tetrahedron. The simplest way of describing a physics that's based on the same geometry for both planetary and human energy fields would be as above, so below, the hermetic motto. Next on our tour is the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel built by Napoleon. When you stand directly under the central arch, your body symbolically resonates with the sun. The name Carousel suggests planets revolving about you. The twelve hedges representing constellations of the zodiac radiate like rays of the sun from exactly where you are standing. In addition to the official allegory of peace being guided by Napoleon's victories, the chariot drawn by four horses on top of the arch could just as well be read as the ancient depiction of Helios drawn by four horses. The oval that terminates the hedges symbolizes Kepler's scientific discovery that planets have elliptical orbits, and the square hedges must be the two foci of the ellipse. Napoleon was most obviously interested in correlating the human body with the sun. Le Notre laid out the Tuileries garden at the request of the sun king. The garden's proportions, fountains, and parterre patterns amazingly fit the Jerusalem rectangle. See how the fountains are tangent to the X's? The octagonal fountain therefore corresponds with the Dome of the Rock, and the round fountain with the Holy Sepulchre. Paris is another New Jerusalem. When you train yourself to see hermetic symbolism, it starts appearing all over Paris in plain sight. It can be a bit overwhelming. Two equestrian statues flank the entrance to the Tuileries from La Place de la Concorde. Her exposed breast suggests this goddess might be Isis. The other rider is Mercury, holding the staff of Osiris, or Caduceus, which has become the symbol of the medical profession. Here's another possible Isis in the garden, and another Mercury. This golden boy is the genie of Paris atop the July column commemorating the revolution of 1830. The genie is Mercury himself. The first time hermetic symbolism had come completely out into the open in France was during the 1789 revolution. Here's the Declaration of the Rights of Man depicting the all-seeing eye of the Supreme Being. Incidentally, this design was influenced by Benjamin Franklin, who was something of a Freemasonic celebrity in Paris at the time. Franklin helped design the Great Seal of the United States, which bears the same all-seeing eye. In time for the celebration of the heliacal rising of Sirius in 1793, this fountain was erected in La Place de la Bastille. The famous artist Jacques-Louis David sculpted the Fountain of Regeneration, with Isis even wearing an Egyptian headdress. The water streaming out of her breasts recalls the image of Saint Bernard de Clairvaux receiving milk from the Virgin. And how can we forget this view? The Eiffel Tower as Phallus of Osiris, with the Statue of Liberty replica on the Seine as his sister bride. The largest square in Paris is up next on the Isis axis. Believe it or not, La Place de la Concorde has an area of precisely 86,400 square meters. Remember the 864-foot-high Transamerica Pyramid and the 864,000 feet from Stonehenge to Silbury Hill? You see, it doesn't matter if we're talking metric or imperial units with shifted decimal places. What matters are the numbers. The fact is, the sun's diameter is 864,000 miles, and there are 86,400 seconds in a mean solar day. The area of the Place thus confirms it as a solar symbol. The cars are likened to planets wandering around the elliptical traffic circle. 
The twin fountains symbolize the watery galactic midplane of the Milky Way, just as they do in front of the Vatican. That makes the Champs Elysees the ecliptic. Le Notre designed La Place d'Etoile, where the Arc de Triomphe stands today. Standing at the center of the place of the star, the ceremonial arch is read literally as a stargate. Twelve streets radiating outward represent a zodiac. The triumphal arch originally honored the warriors who fought for France in the Napoleonic Wars, and it later became the tomb of the unknown soldier. The eternal flame under the arch might be another solar reference. There's certainly a lot of sun worship going on in Paris. Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1798, and not even counting the Egyptians, the French death toll came to more than 20,000 souls. After France's great defeat, Napoleon was asked why he decided in the first place to invade Egypt. He said, I came to draw attention and bring back the interest of Europe to the center of the ancient world. While the campaign was raging, Napoleon spent a night alone in the Great Pyramid, and when asked about his experience, he supposedly said, You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Moving on toward the strange attractor at the end of the axis, we finally conclude our journey through space and time at La Grande Arch. Contemporaneous with the Louvre Pyramid, the Grand Arch was also built at the request of President Mitterrand. This time Mitterrand held a national design competition, but personally selected architect Johann Otto von Spreckelsen in the end anyway. Unfortunately, Spreckelsen died before the project was completed. The location of the Grand Arch has a special relationship to the Arc de Triomphe, the Luxor Obelisk, and the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel. All four monuments are spaced in such a way to create this approximate doubling pattern, suggesting musical octaves. In addition, the Arc de Triomphe is roughly double the size of the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, and the Grand Arch is about double the size of the Arc de Triomphe. In the scaling of these three arches, I see three stargates representing the human, planetary, and stellar bodies, just as we saw symbolized with cubes in London and D.C. Notre Dame Cathedral fits perfectly inside the Grand Arch. I'm guessing this is no accident. A tune in three octaves, if you will. I call it the Symphony of the Stargates. The dimensions of the monumental structure are cubic, with edge length measuring approximately 110 meters, or 360 feet. Researcher Jim Allison realized that 360 feet is also precisely equal to 210 Egyptian royal cubits, and I see that the office windows inside the arch are arranged in groups of 210, providing validation of this metrology. The exterior side symbolic measure depicts 22 over 7 in meters. 22 over 7 is, of course, an approximation of pi. Twelve columns internally support the structure, and a zodiac is literally depicted in the basement floor, making the arch yet another form of sun worship. The sides of the monumental arch actually contain some 40,000 square meters of office space. Multipurpose rooms in the basement measure 400 square meters each. These numbers got me thinking. 40,000 and 400 are very interesting numbers. To appreciate this, let's start with the metric system. The metric system was originally defined by measuring the Earth. The original prime meridian passed through the Paris Observatory and continued all the way around the Earth. This circumference was defined as 40,000 kilometers in the 18th century, and this served to define the metric system. There are 121 documented bronze medallions marked Arago after the French astronomer embedded in streets and sidewalks in a line crossing Paris. These medallions mark the line of the Paris Prime Meridian that was used in France for 200 years. This line touches the corner of one of the Louvre's satellite pyramids. Perhaps this is why the smaller pyramids are there. The meter is the basic unit of length in science today. The meter's definition moved from being based in earth measure to a prototype bar to being circularly defined in terms of the speed of light, which is itself measured in meters per second. 
Christopher Knight in Alan Butler's book, Who Built the Moon, is really an eye-opener. Although I don't agree with their thesis that the moon is an artificial satellite, they have discovered numbers relating sun, moon, and earth that are too perfect to be the product of random chance. For example, consider a solar eclipse. When one happens, the moon completely covers the sun disk. The only reason this can occur so precisely is because the moon is exactly 400 times smaller than the sun and happens to be 400 times closer than the sun during the eclipse. The earth also turns 400 times faster than the moon. The odds of these three seemingly unrelated characteristics would all converge on the number 400 is literally astronomical. As I already mentioned, the Axe Historique is aligned with the heliacal rising of Sirius, known as the Star of Isis. But the Grand Arch is turned approximately 6 degrees with respect to this axis. This is, of course, no accident. Everything has a purpose. Can you imagine the mind-boggling planning that went into the Grand Arch alone? Groundbreaking architectural design that ties together layer upon layer of hidden symbolism completing the hermetic masterpiece that is Paris. Jim Allison has found what the Grand Arch is pointing to. Are you ready for this? It points to the birthplace of Isis in Dendera, Egypt. This tiny, unassuming temple out in back of the larger Hathor temple is known as the traditional birthplace of Isis. The location of the small cube within the larger enclosure matches the azimuth where the Grand Arch is facing. Remember that the heliacal rising of Sirius was the basis of the ancient Egyptian calendar. Well, here is where all of that started. This is where ancient Egyptian priests saw her bright star rising just before the dawn, signaling the beginning of a new year. Isn't it amazing that the Champs-Élysées and Pennsylvania Avenue share the same astronomical orientation with this tiny backwater in modern Egypt? Backwater it may be today, but symbolically it's the holiest place in the cult of Isis. Napoleon came here and had a master mason cut out this massive ceiling from the adjacent temple and ship it back to Paris. It's called the Dendera Zodiac and is now suspended in the Louvre. As you can see, the Dendera Zodiac has octogram star symmetry. More than a zodiac, it is a planisphere showing the whole cosmology as seen through Egyptian eyes. Another Louvre ceiling that gets to the essence of things is Francois Edouard Picot's Study and Genius Reveal Ancient Egypt and Greece. Hancock and Bival recognize the importance of this hermetic work in their book Talisman. The painting allows the viewer to see Isis unveiled for Athena. This unveiling references Plutarch's first century depiction of her temple at Sais, where it was inscribed, I am all that has been, and is, and shall be. My veil no mortal hath ever raised. The term genius in the title is the epithet of the divine messenger Mercury, who is introducing Athena to Isis. I think the Western world, exemplified by Athena, is being introduced to the older stream of knowledge coming out of Egypt. As I can attest, the term study in the title refers to the intensive research required to uncover the deep Egyptian connections that the elite is so clearly obsessed with. Returning to Paris, let's look at the Grand Arch with fresh eyes. Remember that everything has a reason. The Grand Arch is in La Défense the modern section of Paris. Why? We need a modern mathematical understanding to perceive its deepest symbol and to recognize it for what it truly is, a three-dimensional shadow of a hypercube. Come again? What is a hypercube? If the square is 2D, the cube is 3D, and the hypercube is the 4D equivalent. Here's what a cube looks like when it's being rotated. Here's what rotating a hypercube looks like in three-dimensional projection. The fourth dimension is hard to imagine because it's literally beyond us. You might be interested to learn that four spatial dimensions were known far before the birth of modern science. Here is what Saint Bernard de Clairvaux wrote to his former disciple who became Pope Eugene III. 
What is God? He is length, width, height, and depth. There are four spatial terms used. Bernard described the fourth dimension in the 12th century. St. Paul also described four dimensions in the first century. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Four centuries before Paul, Plato even described higher dimensional reality in his Allegory of the Cave, which goes something like this. We are prisoners chained in a cave and sit facing a blank wall. There's a fire outside the cave, and unseen people are passing in front of it. We see shadows on the wall, and mistake this illusion for reality. I think we are kept in the dark about a great many things. Notice how the hypercube shadow in 3D projection looks like a cube within a cube. This structure is fractal, meaning the same pattern repeats at different scales. We've seen things like this before in cities, buildings, and art. Consider the fractal-like city of London within Greater London, Vatican City within Rome, and the United Nations headquarters within New York City. On the scale of a building, take a look at the dome of the chain standing immediately outside the dome of the rock. It's the same structure repeated in a smaller scale, hinting at a higher dimensional connection for those who have eyes to read the symbolism. Examples from art are Pomodoro's series of golden spheres within spheres, scattered strategically in the Vatican, UN headquarters, museums in DC and San Francisco. The sacred Egyptian cubit is a unit of measure reserved for measuring the earth. One sacred cubit is equal to 6 over 5 raised to the fourth power in English feet. Think about it. Raising to the fourth power means the sacred cubit is literally a hypercubit. Michelle and Heath have found there are 10 million hypercubits in the earth's polar radius and 63 million hypercubits in its meridian circumference. Now these amazingly round numbers measure our planet with remarkable accuracy. How can this be? Some physicists believe the universe is made of ten-dimensional superstrings, but six of them have curled up into unimaginably small size. The four remaining dimensions express the architecture of the universe. Recall how I saw in the union of both Louvre pyramids the knowledge of how energy flows from the Sun through hyperspace into planetary bodies. In addition, the Earth is measured by a hypercubit whose edge length of 6 over 5 relates macrocosm to microcosm. The Earth is therefore a hyperdimensional object, even though with our normal perception we experience both the Earth and ourselves as being only three-dimensional. Another projection of the hypercube into two dimensions looks like this. Do you see the octogram star within? This is where it all comes from. The Sun is a hypercube. Recall Metatron's cube. Now that we understand the Grand Arch, we perceive Metatron's cube as Metatron's hypercube. This 4D solar symbol appropriately contains the 3D star Tetrahedron and the 2D star of David. We see now why these sacred diagrams are both called stars, because they are projections of our Sun which is itself a star. To make all of this four-dimensional geometry easier to understand, it helps to bring it down a level. Unfolding a square gives you a line. Unfolding a cardboard cube gives you a cross. Unfolding a hypercube gives you a cross made of cubes. Salvador Dali started with this idea when he painted the Corpus Hypercubus. He depicts the crucifixion, yes, but what is he really saying? Corpus hypercubus is the ascended body as hypercube. In analytic cubism, the art movement that anticipated Dali's surrealism, Picasso and Brock depicted objects from a multitude of viewpoints in an effort to see all sides at once. Of all the myriad forms in existence, why did they choose a cube to symbolize their art movement? Could these cubists have been privy to secret knowledge that inspired their attempt to paint the fourth dimension? Or did they follow unconscious synchromystic inspiration? 
food for thought. So now we have the human body, the earth, and the sun symbolized as hypercubes, three cubes if you want to use a 3D symbol. So which is it? It's actually all of the above. The human, planetary, and stellar scales resonate as a fractal structure within the holographic universe. In simpler terms, as above, so below. Metatron's hypercube, as Enoch's hypercube, reveals the cosmic man. Enoch's triangle had the ineffable name of God written on it. Here is that name in Hebrew, which is a language read from right to left. Standing the letters up, we see the depiction of a man made in God's image. The cosmic man is Plato's world soul, alchemy's anima mundi, and the Kabbalah's Adam Kadmon. Here is a piece of my own artwork showing Adam Kadmon emerging from the Tree of Life. If the human body is a temple, then this temple is much more vast and interconnected than we ever imagined. The human energy form resonates with the esoteric architecture of the universe. What we know as the history of civilization is only a very small part of our past. There is something extraordinary about our beginnings not written about in history books. The oldest surviving temples encode an understanding of Earth, Moon, and Sun that is in some ways more advanced than modern science. To catch up with ancient knowledge, a broad interdisciplinary approach is clearly indicated. Specialists in art history, archaeology, architecture, philosophy, semiotics, mathematics, physics, and many others will need to cooperate in new ways. By seriously studying Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid, we've seen how people living at the dawn of civilization possess the ability to accurately measure the size of the Earth and to survey long distances with a precision rivaling GPS satellites. Logically, our civilization must therefore be a legacy from an earlier civilization. Whether this was Atlantis and or an off-world civilization, I cannot presently say with certainty. The rediscovery of the importance of number, geometry, music, and astronomy should rekindle interest in ancient Egyptian knowledge passed down to us by philosophers such as Pythagoras and Plato. Understanding how the macrocosm and microcosm are related through the art of sacred geometry, in the act of measuring structures and the earth, is a thing of profound beauty. Relating sixes to fives by drawing hexagons and pentagons in the landscape, or by measuring with Egyptian units, are brilliant examples of this ancient science at work. Finding Pythagorean triangles, five by twelve rectangles, pyramids, octograms, enneagrams, and zodiacs encoded in much of the world's great architecture and urban design exposes an obsession with ancient symbolism spanning the centuries. The designers take this symbolism so seriously then there must really be power in ancient knowledge. Putting this story together has been by far the most challenging and satisfying project of my professional life. I hope you've enjoyed it and I invite your participation in uncovering more secrets in plain sight. This is Scott Onstott and I thank you for sharing my journey.